three cinephiles have come together to bring you strong opinions, controversial statements, epic battles, and plenty of fun. Introducing our host, the man who watches 52 movies a week, drinks 52 beers a movie, and loves women but hates the woman from the foreign land of Canada, our host, Mood 616. He is widely known as the man who talks too much. His worst enemies are Postmaster P and Pee Wee Herman. He said Hellraiser was overrated and Leprechaun Origins wouldn't suck. He's the full blooded half Mexican, JP. Finally, we have the man who doesn't talk enough. He is best friends with Sean S. Cunningham. His favorite horror movie is Gummo. He is your favorite Jew and mine, Jeremy. Together, they are known for extending a helping hand to Vampircons everywhere. They are the 22 shots of moods and horror. Yes, yes, y'all. What's going down, everybody? It's the 22 Shots of Moods and Horror, episode 25. Yeah, that's kind of a milestone. I am your host, Mood616, and I don't have two co-hosts. I've got two other hosts up in this motherfucker, and they go by the names of NES Ruler 22 also known as Jeremy, and we've also got Double Shot J, known as JP. What's up, homies? What is yo, going yo. on? This is, uh, yeah. you know what I just noticed? We are mm. quickly approaching October. Yes. Oh, and it couldn't be any better. And the first Friday, I'm that. going. I am going to that Rob Zombie haunted house because I want to check that shit out. Now that we've been talking about Rob Zombie so much, hopefully it is not lame. But you know, I would actually like to go back into our archives and like actually, you know, count how many times Rob Zombie's been brought up in episodes. Well, he has to be one of the most actually... talked about people on our podcast he always gets brought up Mm -hmm. it's interesting i'm I'm currently going through those because i'm I'm documenting all the ratings that we've gave out and i'm currently on episode like halfway through episode four uh Mm -hmm. or no five um, whatever one the year end show was i think it might be five um that's a long episode and that that episode still holds up quite a bit uh that that one was a really fun episode when we gave our top tens of 2003 yeah yeah, I'm really looking forward to the top 10 this year. So you guys need to get up on uh, watching some more 2014 release. I think I could come up films. with 10, but I don't know more than that. You know, there's this year's shaping up to be pretty damn good, I have to say. There's some pretty good independent films, and uh, they're out there. They're yeah, definitely is, out there. You, as good you know. as last year, in your opinion, or no? Hell I don't no. know, man. I mean, the year's not over, but, man, I've just come across a couple really, really good ones. So, it, you know, it's interesting. You know, I'm really looking forward to the, you know, the the latter part of the year to see what they have to offer. But I think it's going to be an interesting um, you know, top origins. 10 this year. <laughs> Leprechaun Origins. Yeah. And number one, Leprechaun Origins with a 9.9. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we did mention Rob Zombie in a couple of those first five episodes. So I do know what you mean. And for the 2014 films, like if I made a list right now, I could have 10 films. But none of them would have made my list last year, probably. So, wow, not even one. That's crazy. Yeah, so we'll see. Well, I got to get to watching some more modern films from 2014, and uh, you know, we obviously count films that have been released on DVD in 2014, even yes, though they right. played festivals and limited releases in 2013, or sometimes even 12, sometimes mm-hmm. earlier than that. So. Yeah. I've definitely seen a few, but I need to get on it a little bit more. Well, I still have my number one in my mind, and I watched that movie all the way whew, back in March almost. So, mm. You know, my favorite film of 2014 right now, I'm not going to say, but it's one of the first 2014 uh, releases I watched this year. It's still holding up. Same is here. Moods, Moods, Moods could it's, probably guess what mine is. <laughs> so it's kind of impressive, but... Yeah. Um so how'd y'all uh how'd your weeks go? Terrible. You had yeah. a terrible week? The yeah, this is you, one of the, the worst. Story you weeks told I've today had. Was, the story you told today was sorry, I'm cutting you off. The story you told today was pretty shitty. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that was only like part of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's always doom and gloom, man. Come on. What about you, Jeremy? How was school? Uh it's it's going good. It's a lot of work. Uh, I shot I had a nineteen hour day on Thursday. Shot some stuff for my documentary. I'm doing a documentary on this guy who lives in a house that Ernest Hemingway used to live in for three months before he this is he moved there right after he got married and he moved out and he moved to Idaho and he killed himself. So this is the house he lived in before he killed himself. And the guy who owns it uh, turned the main hallway into a 
a museum and he has like articles and pictures and he created like dioramas with Barbie dolls like recreating scenes that were in Ernest Hemingway's life. It's a really strange dude, but it's a perfect uh Isn't that generally what happens though if you move from like Illinois to Idaho, you just ultimately kill yourself because it's Idaho? <laughs> well, the house that he lived in back in the day was n- not in a good neighborhood. Like it's it's really nice now, but uh when he lived there it was it was pretty run down and, and pretty uh not not too good. So it's mm-hmm. a re- it was a really interesting guy and a really interesting story. So that definitely is an interesting story. Yeah, Different. how's that uh, Argento paper coming along? You doing so search? I was gonna do I was gonna write an Argento paper on Argento's unconventional use of women's films. So I was trying to think of two things, and then I was I was gonna write about uh, uh, Argento. See, I went that again like we did last week. Uh, Argento's. Uh, has a group of films where uh, weak men are dominated by women or, you know, manipulated by women. And I was going to try and connect that to the male, the male gaze. And especially in the bird with the crystal plumage, it's pretty obvious in that movie. I just have to keep on watching, keep watching some of his other films to find uh, examples Mm -hmm. where you see men getting manipulated by women. And then I was going to write about, um, women being in control of their own destiny without a male presence, aka like Suspiria, there's only really three men in the whole movie and they're mm-hmm. death blind and a gay guy. So um, you know, that's what I'm working on right now pretty much. The paper ain't due till December, but I'm just finding stuff so I don't have to, you know, crunch at the end. So Man. I'm working on it but it'll it'll get there. This semester is rough. I have I have to write um three three page papers every week plus whatever I do in my in my filmmaking class. And then at the end of the semester, I have to write uh, three six-page papers and a 12- to 15-page paper. So it's a shit ton of writing, but oh, I know yeah. I know Moods loves that. So Yeah, I've, I've went through that before too. It, it's, it's fun though. I mean, at least you're covering some pretty interesting topics. And, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's, it's not it's hard very coming, generic. Yeah, it's hard coming up with an idea when the professor just goes, okay, uh, you have to come up with an idea to write about. Like when they give you like a prompt and stuff like that, it's pretty simple to to do. But just saying, okay, this is what you've learned. Now you have to connect it to something in your I own see. in your own universe. So I think you should go for the shock and awe approach and and write a write about the Aja Argento being nude in his films. <laughs> see, everyone's been talking about that. On the I know page. because David it's... and Sex. But what the fuck does that have to do, though? You know, she's only weird, man. she's only actually been naked in I think two of his films. Really? Is it really? So. You know that there was an interview with her back in like 2002, saying like, uh, you know, kind of speaking out against it, how she thought it was weird and stuff like that. But you know, at the same time, it's not like you know, it's not like the scripts are written after she's already been, yeah. you know. You know, she's already accepted a part in a film and no. writes a nude well, scene or she something said like that. There's a script there. That, um, something about one of the films. I see. I, I wish I'd seen some of these films so I could, I could like reference them directly, but mm-hmm. I guess she gets raped in one of the films and, and she said something about like, um, you know, I don't know. I love working with him. Uh, I think he's, you know, I, I'm a fan of his work, but I don't know why he has to write all these scenes where I get raped and stuff. Well, 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 listen up here. So Argento even has said that, uh, you know, he likes to kill beautiful women on the screen, but it's not because that he's, he gets like, he gets off on killing these women. It's just how the horror genre is. And that's, it's not like he writes it for, you know, beautiful yeah. women to get killed off. It's yeah. just, I don't, I don't think that anything's weird about that or anything. I just think it, I, I mean, it, you gotta admit, it's, it's a little odd. And I think it's more about, um, I think it speaks more to the fact that they don't have a close father daughter relationship and it's all business, mm-hmm. which is even kind of a little bit, uh, I guess not what you would initially think. You would think it would just be weird, but it kind of makes sense if they don't have a close relationship. But it's also kind of tragic that they don't have a close relationship. I th- yeah, I mean, obviously it's a little weird, you know. It's a father daughter relationship, no matter how you look at it, y- if it's close or not. And she is naked in front of him, so I mean, it is a little awkward. Um, but I don't know, man. I I always chalked it up to being, you know, like a European thing. I but guess I, a little I've bit. I've heard from from a few different sources that 
that it, it's not really a European thing. It's a Dario Argento thing. Yeah, but I also have heard people say that it is, though, too. So, yeah, have you? I mean, it's, I, I guess there is an argument for it, right? But I don't really know. I mean, I'm from the foreign land of Canada, so what Just do I know about yeah, European up, lifestyle? Up where you live, people fart in each other's faces and queef in each other's faces. So uh... that that in fact that is a fact. Yeah, okay. It's very it's very weird out here. Yeah. Um, but just yeah, a little. That's essentially what that's essentially what melts our igloos too. Is all the farting and queefing and stuff. It's <laughs> yeah. it's warm, right? So it melts the igloos. <laughs> uh, just just to be like a little clear that that I read that article so many years ago. So I don't even know if it's legit or if those are actual quotes, but it was what I read was that she has kind of spoke out against it before. You'd probably have to do some research and don't take it to super, you know, hard. Yeah. Cause I don't have the information mm-hmm. to back up my statements right now. But so you know, getting just, back to the whole thing about our gentle, you know, loving or like liking, you know, to kill beautiful women on screen and stuff. I mean, that's just the artistic side of him. I mean, like I said, she doesn't have to be in these films. It's not like he forced her to be in these. You know, these were scripts that were done and whatnot and stuff. I mean, I'm not trying to justify, I'm not trying to justify, you know, her getting naked in front of the camera, but you know, like I said, these scripts were done, you know, prior to her joining the, the cast and stuff. So, um, I don't know. I tend to think he might write them for her, you know, write that, that those characters, those, uh, scenes that character into the film with maybe maybe the phantom of the opera one i know there's a story behind that film which is ultimately one of the worst films that it, it, it's my least favorite or gentle film out there seen it's Dracula? horrible it's horrible um i still haven't actually watched it <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right all the way back in april and you haven't watched it yet no i you know to be honest i'm actually scared to watch it <laughs> i have i'm not joking i'm scared because I mean, in my opinion, it probably it can't be worse than Phantom of the Opera. That movie is fucking terrible. Like it is beyond. I don't even know what the hell Argento is doing with that one. But <laughs> and I've heard a lot of mixed things. I've heard some people say they actually like this new Dracula film, and you know, because it's so bad, it's actually kind of enjoyable to watch. But at the same time, I'm like, Argento doesn't make films like that <laughs> on purpose, you know. So I don't know. It's it's kind of. I, I'm just, you know, I'll watch. You know, maybe I'll watch it this week. And I'll talk about it next week or something, but okay. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, you know, Argento and the beauty of his films. It's going back to Suspiria, you know, killing beautiful women, like, you know, in beautiful forms and stuff. That's just what he's about, I but guess. But you can just, I mean, the killing beautiful women thing, I mean, you can apply that to any any horror director, right? I mean, all the chicks that usually die are beautiful women. Yeah, but they don't die in a stylized way like Argento. Yeah, yeah it's a but little, that just it's a says more different. about filmmaking than than it being specifically you know come on jp let's see if you know what the let's see if you know what the term is what term that he has a distinct style that he uses when he's shooting his films Uh, i don't know if that's do you know moods uh, i'm not exactly sure what you're getting at but starts with an m starts with an m trivia um (laughs) mise-en-scene what's that mise-en-scene Oh yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. But I was saying, like, it, it is it it's been, his it's been style a while used I've... outside of the kills, also though. So I mean, just because it's just his films have a lot of style. It's it's not just mm. the scenes where he's killing women. So mm. I mean, it just so happens that his films have style, and he also does the other thing that every horror film does, and that's kill beautiful women. And but that's... he also kills men in the same. In the same amount of time that he kills women, usually in horror films, men get killed off off screen or in an extremely unbrutal fashion. But are, are gentle. That's very true. Okay, name some name yeah, a lot of slashers. That's, that's, been, actually, that's been noted. No, in Argento films. Oh well, I, no, I've only seen Ar- like two, so I mean, in I Argento go, films, males get killed in the same brutality as women does. But in slasher genre, it is known that males don't get killed as brutally as women do on camera. Think that's true. I yeah, know. I, you know, I've I've heard this argument before too, and I'm like, I don't know, man. I've seen some pretty nasty fucking deaths, and most of them, I'm some like, guts. all the ones that are popping through my head are like, like male deaths. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would need to um, see some like actual statistics to go with yeah. that. Well, that's the thing. That's, that's the just thing. what that's just what I heard in my woman in horror class. I never heard of that idea either before. Well, I think my um, professor talked about it. 
I have one of those. I have one of those uh, Golden Age slasher books. Um, I can't remember the exact title of it right now. It's it's behind me in my room, but and it goes through the Golden Age of, of slasher films from seventy eight to like eighty four and stuff like that. And there's actually a stat in the book because a lot of people are claiming, oh man, women are get they're you know they they die so much more than when, men in films and slasher films and stuff. But the numbers are there. Men, there's actually more on screen deaths for men than there is women. And there's more survivors, and there's more survivors in in slasher films of women from the right? few, of women than yeah. men, and and so and, and this is the, the whole argument back in the days that all oh, slasher films are so sexist, you know they're you know they're always just killing women and treating you know they're portraying women as hold up, hold up, hold up, all hold this up. bullshit, hold up. Of course, there's going to be more women than men who survive. There's always a final girl that's alive. There's never mm-hmm. there's never men surviving unless they're up unless to Texas. it's Friday. In le- or unless it's Nightmare 2. Or, or up to Friday, Friday 4, or Friday 5, or Friday but, you know, 6. Up to but Texas there, but there State. is men, though. There is men. But yeah, that's the whole thing with Slash. Like, up, to Texas, whole. up to Texas Chainsaw, the girl had to get rescued by a male. But after Halloween, uh, you know, the g- girl had to defend her for herself. Mm-hmm. That's why there's so many more girls than there are guys that survive. And that's the argument. There's exceptions. The argument too. It's like, come but on, there's man. A, there's there's exceptions for everything, JP. But like you know, these women are surviving these films, and but you know they're still so sexist. It's fucking bullshit. Mm-hmm. That, that's it's the good, whole Cisco and Ebert shit. They were just exactly. seeing it a certain way, a yeah. very closed-minded way, and that's you know, that's what the conclusion that they came up with. With and it's complete bullshit. It really and, is. I never you know said that argument. For next show, I'll actually I'll grab the book and I'll pull out some of these numbers and just some of the write-ups and stuff on the. It's a really really good book, man. It's really awesome. I have to check so. it out. Yeah, it's you can get it. You can get it on Amazon and shit. It's actually really nice. And it's on fucking four Argento books. It's like fuck. Hope they're not <laughs> shitty. <laughs> yeah, I All need right, to actually so. get around to checking out some of those Argento films. I did pick up his first oh, film, The yeah. Crystal Plumage. That movie's fucking awesome. Oh. That movie's like the main. That's a really good debut film. Yeah, yeah, I got it on Blu-ray, so that's cool. And then I'm gonna grab. I'm gonna do them in order. I'm gonna get Cat and Nine Tails next on Blu-ray. Just a grab- lot of his films, you are. You can't get on. You can only get it through that Anchor Bay Steelbook. If I stand corrected, right moods. The There's that. Remember one? that. Remember that uh, fucking uh, Argento Anchor Bay Steelbook that came out. Oh no! You can get all those films separately. Are you sure? Yeah, I've yeah, seen a lot of them everywhere. Yeah, you can get them also. Um, um, I sw- yeah, I have I have every one of Argento's films on individual release. So. Uh, but yeah, I recommend like pretty much everything up until about opera. Everything after that is kind of like you know, little hit and miss and stuff like that. But like I don't know. I think you, I think opera is like his last like really really great film. I want to know what like big time horror director doesn't isn't hit and miss because like I don't think you could get drama. I mean trauma in an individual release. I've got it. It's an Anchor Bay release. It came oh, really? out early, early 2000s. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. been long out of print, so that's why. Um. But yeah, no, you can get them all. I mean, it's Argento. Come on. <laughs> all right. So I guess you know it's a lot of Argento talks. So JP, we got some. Uh, we got some. It news. has been established that persons who have recently died have been returning to life. Death in Hi. Poland, America. The tragedy of the car proportions. I can honestly tell you that I have never seen anything as shocking as what was discovered earlier today. Just hours ago, police arrested three obsessed movie fans who allegedly committed a series of ritualistic murders after watching last summer's blockbuster movie The Blair Witch Project. There's like one or two that I found kind of interesting, but for the most part, it's. It's been dry lately, and I've been hitting all the sites like I normally do and, and, and things like that, but nothing super substantial has happened, and it's kind of frustrating, actually, because uh, it's almost like – but every time I'm like, there's no news. We're going to – news is going to last like two minutes, but it never does, so I don't even know why I think that way. <laughs> We're always talking about news forever. Uh, the first little piece here is um, – you guys familiar with the uh, Japanese guinea pig series? Yes. Mm-hmm. Those are like the films. They're like kind of like torture films. Uh, mm-hmm. A Mermaid in a well, Manhole and uh, Flower, Flesh, couple. and Blood. I, I've only seen the very first one and it was weird. I think it's like part three or four. It's like it's practically like a comedy. It's like the tone is totally different than the first couple. It's so yeah. bizarre, man. Uh, anyway, there is a American 
guinea pig film that's coming out. It's uh, the trailer yeah, yeah. was released and it, it was just a bunch of um, really good uh, gore facts. Looked kind of uh, uh, you know old. You know, it had that old look to it. Uh, mm. It's going to be released by. Um, unearthed films and i i don't know if it's in production and that was just like a rough cut together trailer or if it's finished but there's no word of when it's actually going to be released but it's going to be the first in a series of american guinea pig films so i actually did hear about this so they're remaking this now so we're gonna get into this again i'm not sure if it's actually like a remake instead or just like a sequel spin-off type thing Mm -hmm. yeah i was a little unclear about that too but i kind of took it that it was like another sequel so I don't know, like an American sequel. I don't know. It's it's pretty much the uh, paranormal activity like Tokyo Nights that happened in 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 uh, Asia or wherever. Um. So yeah. Uh, next up, we have uh, Orchard Film Company production. Whatever they are releasing a film. This now this is uh um partnered with. Uh, shock to you drop like they put out a couple things I, I'm, I'm not sure if i've seen any of them yet but they're putting out a film called Perver- perversion i think uh <laughs> it's a couple of um brothers who go out hunting get distracted from their troubles at home uh ignore the clothes sign ahead and you know stuff like that uh their gear is stolen and they start turning on each other um and probably some kind of it sounds like very like wrong turn ish to me Mm -hmm. i'm not really sure i didn't read the full plot thing i kind of should have probably because i don't know can't remember what it was about but they uh i i think this film has been getting sort of some uh good feedback uh this year like in the festivals and stuff so uh that's pretty cool i guess uh or- Orchard Films and uh, ShockTheDrop.com will be releasing that on VOD um, later this year in January, or I guess mm. it'd be next year, huh? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the next up is a trailer was released for, and the reason I brought this up, I don't think we ever reported on this before, but a trailer has been released for. Um, another Stephen King adaptation. And I believe last week we talked about A Good Marriage. Did we talk about that? Mm, I think we talked about... I thought it was The Stand. Yeah, we talked about The Stand. Okay. Well, a while back I remember talking about A Good Marriage, which was from Full Dark No Stars, and that one went into production. And that one, I believe, has been released or is about to be released on October 3rd, VOD. But... From that same collection of short stories, there was one called Big Driver. Moods, d- d- I know you read some of those short stories. Do you remember Big Driver? Is this the one with the killer car? No. <laughs> oh, there was one that you wrote about a killer car that was like 100 pages. That I yeah, read. like, uh, yeah, Christine and like I said, trucks. It's, it's been a while since I've read, um, some of his, uh, his anthology work or his short story work, but, uh, it, it like these titles always seem to ring a bell. Uh, Big Driver was the one where it was like a rape revenge story. Mm -hmm. Um, And I found it to be like really disturbing. And I I was like, wow, this is like some like it was like I spit on your grave pretty much. So I was like, this is kind of a weird Stephen King story. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. anyway, apparently that film has already been made and it's set to be released because it's debuting on the fucking Lifetime channel. I was like, (laughs) what? On the Lifetime channel? Yeah, so Big Driver (laughs) is going to be on the Lifetime channel. Well, that makes sense. A rape revenge film on the Lifetime channel? I know. I was like, just when I thought, because in the book it was like, all right, this is pretty hardcore. If they ever made this into a movie, it would definitely be like, I spit on your grave, like, unrated. It would be like that. What's the movie called? Big Driver. Making its debut after Golden Girls, The yeah. Big Driver. Yeah, right. But uh, have you guys noticed over these past couple years that Lifetime has been really, like, dabbling in horror? Yeah, I haven't I, seen I saw, anything they've done, but I've known a couple releases have come out. Yeah. Like, like I that saw is, a movie at Family Video that was released by Lifetime, and it was about, like, it was some horror movie. I was like, what the fuck is this? It had to do with, like, a little boy, like, killing somebody or something. It's definitely... A network where you wouldn't think that a rape revenge film would be premiering on. <laughs> that just blows my mind, man. Well, in the book, it's, it's so pretty funny. hardcore. You know, it details yeah, yeah. ape and and 
Uh, I'm gonna have to go. I'm gonna go find the story after the show here. It's a good story. It, it, it does ring a bell, but like I said, there, you know, I've read so many of these, so many of these short story books. There's like 30 stories in each of them, you know, kind of thing. So it's hard to remember them all. Yeah, I, I, I do think that it kind of, I, in the story when I was reading it, I kept expecting like some kind of like big twist or something like that, you know. But it really was just a straightforward rape revenge story. So, um, nice. That was a bit weird, but the detail of like the guy, the rapist, it really was kind of very uncomfortable to read. So, um, yeah, that's something that's going to be on the Lifetime channel. And I did see one of the stills from it and I watched the trailer and the guy that they cast as the rapist, I thought was like a really good casting job because it, it kind of looked exactly how I pictured the guy in the book, except for maybe a little bit more clean. Um, so yeah, next, <clears throat> next little piece of news here. Uh, Eli Roth is once again putting on his producer's cap to produce a film that I believe a trailer came out for, which I don't watch very often. I didn't watch this one. It's called The Stranger. It's from uh, a filmmaker, Guillermo something. Uh, He is making his feature directorial debut. Uh, The film is going to be presented by Eli Roth. And this guy who's directing the film, I believe also is writing that knock knock movie we discussed with eli mm-hmm. roth, or he's or the writer of this movie is writing that with eli roth so um it's a, it's a big core group of guys that have worked together a couple times so far um and it will be about a a mysterious man returns to his home after 16 years which jump starts a bizarre deadly chain of events so when there, i hear the title when I hear the title "Knock Knock," I think of like a cover with like an eye staring through a door, like Mr. Jingles, but with like an eye. Why like, do I feel like there might have been a film called "Knock Knock" with a guy staring is. through a door on the cover? There is. Damn there it, is. that's where I got it from. Then I actually have I have "Knock Knock" one and two. Damn it, I knew there was a movie called that. Okay, so yeah, they're they're Asian films. Yeah. So, but yeah, remember we talked about this last season about how like really knock knock there's already a film called that yeah but that that there was like three films called beneath that came out last year so i know that's beneath the Mississippi. Know, that's that's part of the same conversation though people <laughs> naming their their films with the same titles like in in the same year like home sweet home i just don't get yeah, it that's stupid man it, it really so annoys me, but um you know i'm I don't know. This one sounds kind of interesting from the very mysterious uh, plot summary they give us. A guy returns home after 16 years and it jump starts a deadly chain of events. What well, is yeah, that? Because now, because now you're interested on what these events are. Yeah, you know, it could I guess be, so. hopefully, hopefully they're interesting. At events. any time, like a mysterious person just returns home, like out of nowhere, that kind of interests me for some reason. I, that that's like a plot to a film I would actually like to see. Well, yeah, because it's just it's kind of mysterious, you know. Um, random. Also, that's like that new uh, Adam Wingard movie that's coming out. What's that? It's, is it called The Guest? I think it's called. Oh, is it know, called I Saw the Devil? No, it's not. I Saw the Devil. Oh, is he making that movie too? Isn't that the guy we talked about last week? No, that's the guy I, who I directed Your Next. Yeah, yeah, I don't. I, I think don't... that was him, right? Who's remaking that, I Saw the Devil? Oh, is that who's remaking? Okay. It's kind I of funny. Was actually I just talking about this today. I, all uh, this stuff runs together after a while. <laughs> uh, the movie's called The Guest. That's, I thought that's what it was called. The Guest. Hmm. Yeah, it has a ninety-seven percent on Rotten Tomatoes, fifty-seven fresh, and one rotten. So that's pretty good. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so uh, a little bit of news here uh paranormal activity what like five five six uh, six no i think it'll, it's like officially the fifth one because the oh. marked ones was like a spinoff but now it's not going to be called paranormal activity five it's going to be called paranormal activity the ghost dimensions it's the sixth <laughs> film in the franchise and will be released march 13th 2015 which there was a film called scouts versus zombies that was in that spot it was a paramount film but now uh, paranormal activity is taking that spot so this march is another paranormal activity the, film why in march it's so the fucking- ghost dimensions doesn't that sound like it's trying to piggyback off of insidious to you 
Yeah, like a little that bit. That style, that James Wan, like uh, the other or wherever they called it, the further, you know the, the weirdest, further. That's what it was the, called. The first thing that came to my mind when I heard Ghost Dimensions, and I have no idea why, but I thought a cube. Does that make any sense? No, not at all. It doesn't make any sense. But I was like, Ghost Dimension. I don't know. That's just. Uh, so is it? It's is it? Is this film related? To I, I think it's going to be sequel to, to, to Part Four. To I mean to Part Four, yeah. But you know, like we talked about, Part Five is apparently still connected. Well, to shit, that franchise. Did you got, I just found this out the other day. But you know, Paranormal Activity Two Tokyo Night that was released in Japan. Apparently, yeah. that is like sort of connected to the first film. So I, it's I like a weird. Wait, thing. there's a Japanese Paranormal Activity Two. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. was a spinoff, yeah. but I didn't know about this. Apparently, it doesn't follow the. Anything that happened after Paranormal Activity 2 in the U.S., but the one in Japan kind of branches off into its own separate storyline, but it is connected to oh. the first film. So do we have to watch that one too? I, you can't get it on Region 1, but maybe we will if we oh. really this, want to cover everything. This fucking, this fucking franchise is turning <laughs> into Texas Chainsaw. Dude, confusing. don't talk shit on Texas Chainsaw. That will be that brought up later. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> talking shit about it. It's just I'm always different. Uh, you know, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. This is ridiculous. All these yeah, movies that are connected I, I don't to like think... certain sequels and stuff. Like the, the thing about the Tokyo Nights one is that I don't think the American uh, version or the rights have anything to do with it. I think in Japan they they just decided to copy and make their own sequel. With no, uh, you know, type of released by Warner Brothers. What the the one over in Japan? Yeah. No, I don't think. I I think it was like in another. I'm pretty because I think like the laws are different over there or something, man. Are you sure that there was no region region one release for this? I haven't found one because as soon as I found out, I was like, well, now we're gonna have to cover it, and I looked it up, and I I couldn't find a region one. I swear I've seen this before. But I, I could have seen it, you know, someone showed off and it might not have been a region one. Huh. Like random. Fuck. I've never heard of <laughs> I never heard of something like that. That another country made us a, a sequel that sorta of relates to the American, but it doesn't. Ugh. This well, like I a, mean I, like I guess I will fun. stay say the storyline just so it isn't so vague so you guys understand. The girl Katie in Paranormal Activity One in the Japanese version, a Japanese woman is driving a car and hits and kills that character from Paranormal Activity 1. And then the ghost follows her back to Japan. But is it an Asian lady or is it a girl? An it's, American girl? It's an Asian woman who's in America, hits Katie, and then travels back to Japan. That's the storyline. So it just connects it. So did the girl that he hit, was this a body double or did it actually look I don't, like... I don't know, dude. This is just what I've, I've I heard. Fucking at least make continuity right, damn it. Yeah, but I don't think the continuity <laughs> from from the American films. I don't think Katie's like dead or something. I I don't know. I've only seen the first two. I don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> anyway, uh, we will activity. talk about it's paranormal episode. activities sometime down the line in March. Yeah, maybe. So. There is another Scarecrow film coming out. It's it's simply called Scarecrows. Uh, Sony has picked this one up, and it is, uh, I believe... There's already a movie that came out this year called Scarecrows. It was on What's the there? Sci-Fi channel. Mm. Which movies? I have to find you that movie, too. I don't understand this again. If you're going to make a Scarecrow film, why would you name it Scarecrow? Scarecrow. like fucking... Scarecrows. Well, there's already like four films with the pluralized. Yeah, moods. Fucking pluralize it, you bitch. Man. You know, like seriously, Scare- like come up with something. Oh fuck, that's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I seriously, know. Scarecrows is so generic. Like that is just that really does not make me want to watch that. Even though I love killer scarecrow films. Yeah, I know. That. There's not really enough good ones out there. I mean, it seems like an easy concept, right? I mean, Dark Knight is Scarecrow's fantastic, but I feel like. There's like, name, name this shit like straw guts or something. Straw guts. <laughs> what the fuck? 
Like, remember fucking that? seriously, anything's better than fucking Scarecrow. I would not like, watch remember? Scarecrow. Are you kidding me? If I fucking was in the movie store and I saw a film called Straw Guts, that yeah, would instantly, I would get instantly my... think it's going to be one of those so bad it's good and not like a serious movie. Yeah, but remember the movie that came out this year? That's... How could you not take a film called Straw Guts seriously? Shit, man, that, that just screams like that just screams like Exorcist serious, you know? Yeah, but remember, the, remember the movie that came out? Remember the movie that came out this year, just titled Home Invasion? Like I, that pissed me off so bad. It's like, can't you come up with a name besides Home Invasion on a Home yeah. Invasion movie? Yeah, you can't like get any more thing. generic than that. Like, just name your film after like a subgenre of horror films: Home Invasion, Giallo <laughs> Part Two. Yeah, but anyway, this it's like film... naming your film The Possession. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I think we can all agree that the film titles have really been declining. And there's just so many. I mean, honestly, you just get confused now. I want to go see a movie called Scarecrows, and I, there's probably like four to pick from. I think that's what it comes down to, too. It's well, fucking I saw, confusing. I went to the theaters and saw a movie called Creature, so that's pretty shitty as well. So, The film follows a mother and her young daughters who fight for survival after falling into a terrifying and bizarre nightmare conceived by a psychopath. So, yeah, sounds kind of generic, but this film is going to be uh, released through um, Blumhouse's newly launched uh, label, which I wait, think wait, is pretty what's cool. The, what's the name of the studio sub-label? Uh, Blumhouse. Blumhouse? Yeah, dude. What are the Blumhouse. movies that they released? That's uh, Jason Blum, um, the like Insidious and all those things. I've never heard of that. <laughs> yeah, dude. They've put out some good stuff. Like uh, it's a production company, but it, it's going to be released October sixth. Um, so yeah, Scarecrows. Look forward to that. Uh, after that, we have Amityville: The Awakening. Wasn't there a trailer release for this thing? We've talked about this in the past. I know it. Is this the found footage one? I can't the remember. The House. No, there was. But didn't unless the trailer just come there's out? Another That's my Amityville. question. Um, yeah, I think so. I swear I they were so. making like a yeah. found footage Amity film movie. Well, there was one a couple years back. It was, really? yeah, there was a found footage one that came out. All right. I'm well, I didn't. I, I'm not exactly sure because I really didn't even care to to like fully investigate on this one. But I guess that it was planned to be released uh, this year, maybe December. I think December. And now it's being pushed back to 2015 sometime. So something happened. Yeah, I still think it's so crazy that they're still making Amityville films that are related. Well, not technically related, but they're still connected to like the original franchise. Yeah. I think that's so random that a sequel or a sequel, a remake came out. I don't know what, almost 10 years ago now. Um, and they've released how many sequels? connected to the original franchise I mean, like well, four i guess the only way you can like, determine which ones are connected and not is which one are the ones produced by the weinstein company in dimension right um the ones that followed those first three and you know however many after because there there are films with the am with amityville in the title that are totally not part of that series oh yeah but where sure. does that line be, be like get drawn because it's, some of the other like later ones I don't think had much to do with the series, right? No, they they totally don't. I've had people ask me they're like, "Well, what's with this Amityville film?" And I'm like, "To be honest, I don't fucking know." <laughs> <laughs> like, I really don't have an answer for it. I'm like, I, I just don't know where they keep coming from, and I don't know. It, it's just you know, make a film and put fucking Amityville in the title. It's like um, it's like that film that I talked about. Oh, is that the last... Bates one? Yeah, the the yeah. Bates yeah. haunting. You know, that's maybe right there. Right away, everyone's like, well, is that related to the, uh, you know, obviously the bait story? And I'm like, no, it actually isn't at all. It's just their fucking name. So that was, that's kind of a sneaky, uh, kind of a sneaky selling point right there. You see Bates and you're like, oh, you know, mm -hmm. it's got to have something to do with the Bates family. But no, it, it doesn't. <laughs> Fuckers. Yeah. So after that, uh, yeah, it's being pushed from 2014, late 2014 to early 2015. Nobody even cares. I don't think. Um, so unless they're going to make a serious attempt at doing another Amityville, doesn't this one just seem like a cash in? Cause like it's called oh, Amityville, yeah. the awakening, Jesus Christ. Every Amityville I mean, after the first one is a cash in. No, you, the second it, one is a quality movie. 
the second movie is really fucking good, actually. Yeah. yeah. But honestly, some of the later sequels are actually dreadful. They are fucking <laughs> they dreadful, are, dude. man. I've only they seen are the so bad. One and, and a couple others on TV. And like, like Dollhouse sells for like twenty dollars. Like, why the fuck are people Ugh. paying this much money for that? Yeah, fuck, it's it's know. simply just because it's out of print. But I mean, honestly, like the second one is a quality prequel. Like I re- yeah. I like the second one better than the first one. That movie is pretty dark and it. At times, especially with the whole incest thing, mm-hmm. I've never seen it. So, give it a chance, dude. That's yeah. an interesting. That's an interesting question right there. That would be. I'd like to hear people's answers on. Actually, would dude, be. Uh, we should do an Amity full show. An Amity. Oh my god, we wouldn't be able to find all the fucking movies. Mm-hmm. Um, no, but like that's an interesting question. Uh, films or sequels that you actually like better than the original film. Yeah. Right. So, like in Amityville the Amityville case, it would be, you know, the sequel. I prefer part two over the first one also. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's something about that now, sequel that just really kind of does it for me. But I think uh, what it happened with me was I thought the first Amityville was really scary when I was a kid. But I think mm-hmm. the rewatch is not there in the first Amityville. But the second one, it also has some creepy dark moments and the rewatch is way better. So that's why I think yeah, I yeah. Like the second one better. But I do think maybe the first one might be a better film, technically. I, I have went through stages with the Amityville horror. Um, for years and years, I really liked the film. And then I went through the stage where I wasn't really feeling it that much. Like, I, I wasn't disliking it. Maybe I was just sick of it. And I really was watching part two a lot more and stuff. And I just became a little more custom and just kind of preferred that one over the original one. But I went back and watched um, the original Amityville horror film, I guess probably when Scream Factory put out the box set. Yeah. Um, probably most likely because I wanted to obviously check out the transfers and stuff. And I really enjoyed it. I don't know if it was the mood I was in, but it was just, it really, I don't know, maybe the transfer, I don't know what it was. The sound quality was really good, but I really kind of enjoyed it again. And I was like, you know, but I mean, it's nothing to take away part two. Part two, I still prefer um, but I really did enjoy the the original one again, you know, and it, maybe it's because I went, you know, there was a bunch of years there. I hadn't seen it, but I don't know. It, it's kind of weird with films like that sometimes. The next one is um, more TV stories. And this is I don't know how much this relates to horror, but it is Stephen King. But I think this is one of his non horror books. And what's funny is Jeremy just mentioned this book last week. It's eleven twenty two sixty three, the Kennedy I know, I know, one. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Jason Kennedy. from Beyond the Realms has posted a review of that book up on his Facebook like today. Actually, I mean, but it's such a good book. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. I highly recommend it. So what's happening is you guys know how like Netflix and Amazon are, are creating their own. Uh, unique content like Orange is the New Black and, and uh, Hemlock Grove and stuff like that. Um, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Hulu also does this and they are going to create a, I, I guess it would be a TV series based on a, that, that book. And it's going to be, I guess, produced by J.J. Um, Abrams' production team. And Stephen King's pretty excited. He said if he ever wrote a book that cries for the long-form uh, event TV programming, it is this book. So he's pretty jazzed about it. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm not sure how much that relates to horror because I haven't read the book. But it is Stephen King, so it's It's amazing. Noteworthy. It's fucking awesome. Highly recommend it. It's long. It's about a 1,000 pages, but it's really, really good. The last piece of news is a very weird, bizarre, shocking little news story here. This was the one I found the most interesting just because it's like, what the F? But apparently the woman who played the original Jennifer in 1978's I Spit on Your Grave, a.k.a. Day of the Woman, will be starring in a new I Spit on Your Grave film. Uh, so I don't know if this is going to be I Spit on Your Grave 3 or I Spit on Your Grave 2, but it's going to be I one heard, of those. I heard it's an official sequel to the original. That's what I just said. Yeah, so why the fuck would it be I Spit on Your Grave 3? Because maybe they would wow. tie it into the, so the, I don't know, the third one. So Camille Keaton, the star of the film, is going to be starring in another You didn't I hear about this, Moods? No, I, I I purposely stay away from the news, so I'm shocked when I hear it on the on the cast. Um, yeah, that's interesting because she actually did a film called Act of Vengeance. Was it Act of Vengeance? Uh, I can't remember. Um, Savage Vengeance. That's what it's called. Back in like the early '90s, it was like a shot on video film that was like 
I spit it on wasn't, your grave too. It was like considered it, it was, that, right? It, it was considered that called Savage Savage Vengeance, and it was you know starring Camille Keaton, and it's basically the same type film. But yeah, that's interesting that she's doing another one. Yeah, that's what I was getting at when I met like three. I I have not seen that, so I don't know like how much of a spinoff sequel thing it is. But anyway, she's going huh. to be like reprising her role, I guess, and um. I get like I guess she's gonna get raped again. <laughs> I don't know like how do you make it yeah, that, otherwise? That poor character has been raped in like all stages of her life. <laughs> the seventies, the nineties, the two thousand teens. What the fuck? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's, that's, over- that's a fucking bad luck right there. That's bad luck. It's crazy. Yeah, but so, yeah. So what is it? Is, it doesn't have an official title. Uh, I don't think. So. It, I, oh, uh, I think it's I spit on your grave. Deja vu. Yeah, I think that's... Deja Vu? <laughs> I, th- I yeah. think I read that oh, was the okay. name of it, too. Yeah, Holy and it does crap. share characters as well as continuity with the original 1978 cult classic. Wow. Very, very interesting. Huh. Yeah, like that. that is, See, like, a is... weird thing to do, though, right? Yeah. This is why I stay away from the news, because this was quite shocking to me. <laughs> I like I, actually, it does have a um, synopsis that I didn't notice the first time. Following her rape, Jennifer Hills wrote a best-selling account of the ordeal and the controversial trial in which she was accused of taking the law into her own hands, brutally killing her assailants in a small town where the rape and revenge took place. The relatives of the four rapists she killed are furious. Count, uh, court declared her not guilty and resolved to take justice into their own hands. See, that sounds a little bad to me. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds a little like, you know, phoned in, like, uh. Yeah, yeah. Huh. But still, it's, it's a I'm st- you weird, don't... intriguing idea. Regardless, I'm still gonna check this out, though. I think it's funny. I, I like all these I Spit on Your Grave films, even the remakes. I, I don't know, man. They're enjoyable. The second so ch- one's brutal. So check this out. This is a little theory I have going on. So. You guys remember back in 2003, right? What film created the whole remake trend? Texas Chainsaw. Yeah. And now it seems like after Texas Chainsaw 3D, which is like... Which the, we'll hear later the on. The sequel to the original. Doesn't it seem like more and more people are doing this sequel to the original thing now? There was another one that happened that I forgot about, but uh, this one, you know, I spit on your grave. Texas Chainsaw is a trendsetter, man. Is isn't it, isn't the town that dreaded sundowns going to be like a sequel sort of? I don't know what the hell that thing is. I, I'm still confused on that, man. I was actually having this conversation today, and somebody literally asked me that, and I was like, I actually don't know all these damn questions. I don't know the answers to. Um, yeah, I don't know either. But I, you know, at the same time, I kind of wanted it to be um, like a straight up remake, but just with a more serious tone. That, that's, I, that's the one issue I've always had with the town that dreaded sundown. It's, it's a good film, but it seems like every time I watch it, it's kind of, I posted about this one time in the group page that no one really actually even responded to it. Um, but it was, I was just using that film as, as an example of a film that every time I watch, I seem to like not like it as much as the time before. Uh-huh. You know, and it, it's there's something about the tone of that film. Like there's really goofy cops and there's some goofy music and stuff with with serious content. You know, it's like based off this, you know, these murders and stuff. And and it just there's something about the tone of that film just kind of gets to me. So when I heard about the remake and stuff, I was like, well, or the supposed remake, um, I was kind of hoping for like a like a full blown, like serious toned film, um, like really dark and stuff. So but, but from what I if we don't even really know what it is, so. From what I understand, it, it's not even serious, though. Like, I think that it's not from from what I've been getting. But that is gonna about do it for the news. Um, that spit on, I spit on your grave news is definitely the most interesting of the week. Hopefully, it picks up a little bit because the news has been pretty whack lately, and. I need to get more organized. So, Moods, how about some uh, DVD and Blu-ray releases for the start of Mood Swings? Yeah, 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 Mood Swings. Um, yeah, DVD and Blu-ray releases for September 23rd, 2014. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I said 14 like that. Did that make any sense? No, 14. Fourteen. No, I, it, I don't know. I just like saying 14. Shut up. Okay, whatever. Um <laughs> <laughs> fucking stupid but anyways um of course the biggest release uh probably 
the most anticipated release, I would say, for a lot of people this year, is coming out this Tuesday, and it is the complete Halloween box set in, on Blu-ray, um, the 15 disc, and plus you can also get the, uh, I don't ten, know what it is, ten what disc. It, the 10 disc, the 10 is disc version too. Is that even gonna sell at all? Absolutely I, not. I think it's just I, a waste of I time and not. space, dude. Me Nobody's and my buddy were talking. That. Me and my buddy were talking about this today, and I even said the exact same thing to him because we were talking about the Halloween box set and how the price is actually pretty good. You know, like ninety four bucks or whatever It's not bad for what you're getting. Fifteen discs, pretty good. It's nowhere near even bad at all. I have no. I don't even know how somebody would justify saying that that's not a good price. And how much cheaper yeah. is it from like the other one? The other one is seventy four, I believe, oh. or something like that. And you so get five less discs. Yeah, five def- five less discs for twenty bucks cheaper, which. I don't know. Whatever you got to go with the the you know the complete one with the uh, the um, producer's cut of Halloween Six. I mean that's really what the selling point is. But it's nice packaging, man. I really I really like it. Yeah, I'm digging the, those fucking black cases, man. It's really the really cool. Only way I think this set could have been better is one if the theatrical cuts of Rob Zombie's films were there. That's yep. the only thing it's really missing. That's what I read. Like a lot of people's complaints were that it didn't have the theatrical yeah. It's cuts. not a big deal to me, but it is a little, a, like yeah. a little misstep. I, I was a little surprised actually because, you know, they could have just, yeah, like just, you know, put the unrated and the, the theatrical cuts and, you know, in the same case kind of deal. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think that's a little misstep because I think a lot of people, I think mo. M- kind of prefer the theatrical of Halloween 2. I mean, if you enjoy that film. I, I know that's been discussed too long, quite a bit. Like the director's cut of Halloween 2. Uh, yeah, the ending's different too. And, yeah. you know, there's certain... I mean, we've covered this quite a bit. But yeah, there's I a just, lot of difference between Halloween 1 and the... Yeah. Um, I just don't understand why they didn't, though. It would have been nice. It really actually would have been nice. Um, yeah. To be honest, I don't even own a copy of the theatrical version of Halloween 2. Um, yeah. I have... The Blu-ray unrated version, but I never. You know what's saw, crazy? I still don't actually have it. I saw it in the theater, though. Yeah, that's the only place I saw it too. Was in theaters. Yeah. Just the last time I saw it. You know, yeah, I actually I like to shoot myself. I actually don't even own a copy of Halloween Two. That's the only one I don't own. The Blu-ray huh. sound is fucking amazing on that movie. The sound is so good. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the only only other thing that I think would have like just threw this release into overdrive is if they designed new uh you know collector's edition cover art either for the main box or for you know the individual that like uh you know cases that would have just been something amazing to do you know at the same time i do like how they use the original uh cover arts and stuff for halloween 2 and 3 and stuff i like that yeah. You know, I'm I'm not really complaining about that. I do like that, but I know what you're saying though. It's not but, a I mean, complaint at all. It's just like I'm thinking of ways that it could be better. And this is literally I th- I have no issues with this box set. I think it's I don't I, I actually like feel bad for the people that are complaining about it. I'm not buying it because I'm not fucking rebuying movies, man. Not spe- <laughs> I know. Not spending a hundred and twelve a hundred bucks on the producer's cut. <laughs> And a, and I think it's features. worth it for me. There's a lot of good stuff in here. And I, I don't know, like to me personally, I haven't bought every edition of Halloween that comes out and, and things like that. So I always wait for the for the edition that I think is is for the price what you get matches. And, you know, that's why I haven't bought the Child's Play set and I probably won't ever buy it because I just don't feel like it's it's worth it. And those films will get released again when – chucky eight comes out or whatever so i'm just waiting until i see a good one that i like just same reason why i didn't buy the uh friday the 13th set is because it's just not worth it to me yet there will be a version out there that will be i'm i'm good with my deluxe editions for now but this halloween set is worth it that's the problem guys don't buy every single release that comes out unless you're an absolute diehard fan of that but you know try to space it out wait for the good one that you think is worth it Mm mm-hmm yeah, I have way too many editions of every <laughs> Halloween film. It is like my Halloween collection is enormous considering it's not my favorite franchise. It's ridiculous when you look at my collection. Um I have like I have so many more editions of Halloween films than I, I, I my my Nightmare on Elm Street collection doesn't even come close to my Halloween. Yeah, and, which is just odd. They just release so much stuff and I well, those like, Elm Street films have been disrespected for far too long. Yeah, yeah I think they, I have like 
six copies of Child's Play on Blu-ray and DVD Beyond and like three on DVD. <laughs> I have Child's Play yeah. on Laserdisc, Child's Play 2 on Laserdisc. I have like so many movies in the Child's Play series. Like It's a little I, different when it's your favorite film though, right? I mean, yeah. you want to collect every edition you can. But yeah, you know, my favorite, you know, Nightmare the Elm Street series is my favorite franchise and I have, you know, the original DVD box set and I have that shitty Blu-ray set. Mm-hmm. That's the both, extent yeah. of my collection. Like I don't mm-hmm. have any other special like digi books or, you know, steel books of the original film or anything. Like those films, they have been released. Like I I know there's a steel book of the original one and stuff, but there hasn't been a lot of editions, you know, for for the Elm Street series, you know, compared to like Halloween and Friday and stuff like that. I mean, even Texas Chainsaw, man, fuck, dude. There's so many editions of, of TCM, it's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, but you know that, JP. I mean, if you started collecting all those, you'd probably go bankrupt. Yeah, and you know how many editions of Texas Chainsaw I own? Like mm-hmm. three. Yeah. Did you pick up the new 40th I anniversary did. Blu-ray? I probably will grab that because I skipped out on the first Blu-ray. Amazon.com had it for like 18 bucks the other day. Yeah, it was cheap. It was fucking cheap, mm-hmm. man. Yeah, I actually no, wasn't it off there. money at the time. Yeah, so... All my money was on pay. Dude, I hate that. Speaking of that, I had like a hundred and some dollars in my PayPal account for my Halloween box set. And, and it just annoyed me that I couldn't buy, like, I couldn't buy, like, Amazon stuff through PayPal. Like, I didn't even. Yeah, that, that always bothers me. But there is a solution around that. You just have to find somebody to swap, uh, you know, convert yeah. it for you. I, well, I've, I bought a gift card, is what I did. With, I just bought a hundred dollar gift card. Yeah. Mm-hmm. With mm-hmm. PayPal. So yeah, so that's the big release, obviously for September twenty third, the Halloween box. That I think a lot of people are going to pick it up. I know, I, I know. Even Zach posted on the the group page. He said, "Fuck it, this is mm. this is it." Like he's even actually giving away his digi book on his channel, actually, um, as we speak. I think it's the contest or something. Or he's going to be posting it this week or something like that. So, I mean, I think people are getting a little. <laughs> they're getting a little fed up with these Halloween releases, but at the same time, I mean, you can't beat this, man. This yeah, they're all in one place, right? Amazing. I mean, that's yeah. never happened. It, it is is the complete edition. This is what everybody wanted for a long time. It's it's yeah. finally here. You know, Let's it's funny. It. We even talked. To, we remember we we even talked about this one time about how this was never going to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, we're like, oh, the Halloween series Especially will never come together. With the producers cut. Now it seems so yeah. obvious. Like, it, obvious, like, yeah, they released the producers cut. Of course they was. But but this kind if of you go back a couple of years, like it felt like that thing was never going to get released. And ever. from what I read, the producers cut is fucking looks so good. It's not even like I know. I, I've been hearing. I've, I've seen just screenshots and stuff, and I'm like, holy fuck, that's crazy, yeah. man. I have a feeling in a couple months they will announce a standard single. Exactly, single and then I didn't dish. have to spend 120 dollars on it. Yeah, I mean, they're definitely, I mean, it would make sense for them to release that individually. I mean, for the people that don't want to pick up these sets, they're going to grab that. Yep. I mean, let's face it, they're going to definitely pick that up. It's so. another way to make money in a couple months, so I'm exactly. sure they will do it. Exactly. I mean, fuck now, I've even got two copies of the Scream Factory, um, Halloween 2 and 3. <laughs> yeah. Now we just need Halloween. You know, like, I actually do have those Blu-rays of Halloween 4 and 5 also, but I got those for yeah, free, so... I'm not even oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. You actually did win those in a contest, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and honestly, my Halloween six, seven, and eight are on a four pack, so I'm I'm happy to upgrade for this set. Yeah, I've got those shitty fucking. I think they're the Echo Bridge Blu-ray releases or whatever. Yeah. Um, me and Jeremy were actually talking about how he said the H two O and uh, Resurrection yeah. apparently don't look very good in this box set. From I was what like, I've, how, from I'm what like, I've how heard, is that even? possible i what mean I've resurrection heard, can't look any worse than the echo bridge but when i've heard the resurrection looks worse than the echo bridge release. yeah i read one review the blu-ray.com review and it was saying that but i don't know dude sometimes i feel like it depends which guy's reviewing shit on there mm-hmm. um some people are just more snobby than others man but i just don't get how it could actually look worse does that yeah. really make any sense like it shouldn't at all like it, it should we'll totally look better but at the same time like i said to jeremy i said it's resurrection i'm mm-hmm. probably not even gonna fucking watch it to be honest um i mean i'll pop it in and check out the pq but i mean resurrection is one film that i just uh it it, it kills me a piece of me dies every time i watch that film yeah so but anyways that's uh the halloween complete <laughs> series people run out by that support screen factory um so next up, there's a film called Legend of the Hillbilly Butcher. <laughs> I mean, seriously, the Legend of the Hillbilly Butcher. That's I mean, a that, that has every, 
that has everything going for it, though. Come Sounds on, like Hillbilly a and movie. Butcher and Legend, the Legend of the Hillbilly Butcher. Um, I don't really know anything about this one, but I know some people really dig these Hillbilly type. You know, it, it's probably some backwoods slasher. It's really probably generic, but I don't know. I thought the title was worth mentioning. I know this is a release that a lot of people are picking up. Um, I am on the fence with this one because I have the DVD uh, anthology set of it, and I think this Blu-ray set is the exact same, just converted to Blu-ray. I think it looks exactly the same, um, and that's the Exorcist Complete Anthology. Yeah. Um, I think the yeah. price alone is the selling point on it, really, because I think this this is kind of it's going to be one of those like really thin type, you know, box sets. I, probably in the vein of like. Um, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street type deal. I think uh, it's going guys... to be exactly the same set, just Blu-ray. Like I think thickness I th- and everything. I think I think exactly, exactly. So, I, I mean, to be honest, I, I have a steel book of the Exorcist on Blu-ray. Do I really need the other films on Blu-ray? The only other film I wouldn't wouldn't mind is Part Three, which I think is um, the second best film in the entire anthology. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to spend the thirty bucks or whatever it is just for one film. I mean. What are your guys' thoughts on The Exorcist? Uh, Anthology. Well, to be honest, I... It's like, if it's under 20, I'll maybe buy it. I, I am have the not other getting this. The reason I'm not even why, sure what the price is right now, actually. I know it's cheap, though. The reason why I'm not getting this is because if I see it one day for, like, you know, super cheap or something, I, I'll probably get it. But, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go out and look for it. Because I don't even really like that series that much. I've only seen one and two. And the beginning and the other prequel. Actually, three is the only one I haven't seen. So I guess I did see almost all of them. Uh, but I like the first film. The second one I don't really like. And the other two I don't really like that much. So Yeah. Part three is you know, probably the best one <laughs> besides the original. Yeah, that's what I hear. I do hear really good things about part three, actually. And, and the thing is, I have that anthology set. And I've still not even watched all the films in it. I've only watched mm-hmm. The Exorcist and The Exorcist 2 in that set. To be honest, it's it's not one of my favorite franchises either. I'm not a big fan of the prequels, and part two is <laughs> is, is arguably laughable. Um, yeah, but, and uh, probably one, the one only way the only way that I'm gonna watch these is if we did cover them on the show. Yeah, um, but yeah, once again, it's like you know, really, I'm not gonna pick that up just for just for one film. So yeah, you know. But yeah, um, what else we got coming out here? September 23rd, I gotta scroll, sorry. Um, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. The, uh, the Blu-ray release and DVD special editions of Stage Fright, uh, released by Blue Underground is another big release that's coming out. This one was announced a while ago. Um, finally coming out. You know, I'm, I'm really, really not interested in upgrading. Like I have the original, uh, Blue Underground release of this and, um, I don't know. I just, I don't think I need to upgrade you know, to the Blu-ray and stuff, but props if you do. Stage Fright's an amazing film, so um, I'm not really too sure what the price is on that one, but um, next up, uh, the label Macabre. It's about 25 Macabre. bucks from Amazon. Yeah. Is it 20? Yeah, it's actually, still, that's pretty pricey actually. Yeah. Um, Macabre or Macabre, however you want to pronounce the, uh, the label's name, is releasing a film called Found. Mm-hmm. Which looks really, really fucking good. And I've heard, yeah, heard fucking good. gas mask again. I think Adrian. Said it, it got too. a dude on the cover with a gas mask. I know, I know. That's really funny. But this one, I've heard nothing but good things about. Yeah, it's been getting really good reviews, and from you know some very credible people too. So, um, yeah, that's that's very intriguing to me. But yeah, actually, my copy shipped today. That's. Mm. So I'm I'm excited about that. Family video shall have that. Nice. Now we um, have to wait seven weeks. <sighs> next up is a film called Were. I've heard w- good things about this one. W E R Were. Um, it's from the director of The Devil Inside. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so that read there, I was like, ah. Oh. But I actually haven't heard much on this one. You you have heard good things about this one, JP? I, I've only heard one good thing about it from uh, – so I guess it wouldn't be good things. But uh, Rich from The Devil's Eyes said that he really liked this one. So it's a werewolf film. I don't know. Oh, OK. That, he that also rated Chud 10 out of 10. So <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking awesome. Uh, next up is a film called Collapse, which again, I don't know anything about. Um, yeah, I've – this is obviously some type of 
outbreak or zombie film, whatnot. So I don't know. These type of films are very kind of generic and, you know, zombie films. But uh, next up is a film called Slasher House. <laughs> <laughs> I just, this one right here, the cover alone is cracking me up. Because They're not it's got even like, trying. Like, the, it's got a clown on it. It's got some other fucking freaky motherfuckers. But it's like four killers and one girl. <laughs> So I'm not really too sure what this one's all about. Who's releasing uh, it, does it say? Uh, it doesn't say, actually. Oh. Um, yeah, so I don't I don't really know what to think about that. I don't even know what the fuck is going on. It, 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 that When I look at the cover, it reminds me of that film called Slashers. You know, the one where they're, these guys are on this game show and they have to basically beat out Slashers. It's kind of like the running man, but like horror style. So like the Uh-Oh show? Um, no, no, this one's a little different. You're, it, you're like... It's I don't know. You're kind of like you're in this like huge maze. In, Is that the uh, one with the guy like slashes. holding a girl's throat or something? On the cover, there's a couple different covers of that film actually. I've seen different ones. Um, another film called Bigfoot Wars. Now this one actually kind of wait that one's attention. already out, isn't it? I, I swear I've seen that at Walmart like a while ago. Uh, it might it might could have been put out early too. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It says it's coming out. But it says uh, in the description, it says after the sheriff of a small town of Boggy Creek <laughs> receives reports of attacks. So this one has to do with like Boggy Creek, which is interesting. Um, don't really know. I, I, I'm not even sure if it's found footage film. We talked about this last week, all these fucking Bigfoot films that are found footage. Like really, really need to stop doing that. Yeah, that um, wasn't the one. It, there, it, apparently, there's just a Bigfoot film that comes out every week in walmart so <laughs> i know right and like nine times out of ten they're found footage uh then we got the complete uh saw series and i believe in this blu-ray set these are all the unrated films so that's cool and i believe this is really really cheap like but 20... i heard it's only on three discs though yeah, yeah but it's blu-ray I... Yeah, I don't give a shit, though. Three discs, seven movies, yeah, and it's twenty four ninety nine on Amazon.com. That's so, a good price. Um, once again, it's it's uh, a set I'm not going to pick up because I already have all the DVDs, and I don't really f- feel like upgrading to if Blu-ray I for basically no reason. If I was you and I own those DVDs, and uh, but I own like half of – over. I think I only need two more on individual Blu-ray release. But if I only have the DVDs, this is a set I would pick up. Really? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I just I'm really really trying to not upgrade things that I don't necessarily need to. Yeah, I guess you know, so, I just but... you know it's just one of those things, right? Like I don't I don't mind watching the original Saw film on DVD. You I know, don't it know doesn't... when it happened that the Saw franchise has been like swept. The, it, it's almost like considered like a bad thing now. It's this pretty okay franchise, isn't it? Like I remember I've only seen the first like five films, I think, but. I don't rem- – it seems like there's just this negative thing around the Saw franchise nowadays and I really don't get it. I think it probably has a lot to do with the fact that they you know, put out like seven films in seven years. It just maybe kind of oversaturated the market a little bit. Mm-hmm. Maybe people just got sick of, you know, oh, there's another Saw well, film coming that out. is what it – It almost people, became laughable. Yeah, well, people are just October. sick of Saw. But I don't yeah. know, dude. There was like – like I think we look back on like the Friday the 13th series with like nostalgic, awesome, loving eyes. But I think from what I understand from the people that I've talked to is they kind of felt the same way. Like, shit, another Friday the 13th coming out this year. Like, you know, so, I mean, maybe the Saw franchise will kind of get those those uh, nostalgic look backs eventually. I look back on it with nostalgia. I remember everybody getting so excited around October every time a new Saw came out. I like that. I know it's getting released, re-released in October for the 10th anniversary. The first one is. Like it's getting ten, like oh wow it's already been ten fuck that's dude crazy. I saw that movie when I was ten years old in the theater yeah. I felt like such a bad person <laughs> <laughs> I'm still championing for a Saw uh, show so one day fucking, guys one fucking day. me and my grandma I'm ten years old I'm sitting there watching Saw yeah it's, it's my childhood that's awesome yeah all right so the, another film called The Rover um, another film I know absolutely nothing about it's got it is that on fucking this. awesome it's awesome wait you've seen this I have. It's a, nice. it's a post-apocalyptic movie with Robert Patterson and Guy Pierce. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Highly recommended. It's fair. It's awesome. It's good. Yeah, see that that in, that intrigues me because I like post-apocalyptic films yeah, actually I do quite too. a bit. So this is yeah, this could probably work for me. So it's really good. I recommend it. 
Awesome. Nice. Okay, well, that's interesting. That's so. one I totally would have skipped by just based on the cover because it looks like more of like a drama film or something. Oh, so, I'm and glad the Blu-ray, you the Blu-ray on Amazon.com is sixteen ninety nine. So that's actually you know not overly expensive. But um, so last up for the ones that I have, Jeremy, Jeremy, JP might have a few more here. Well, I but. just want to say something too when you're done. Okay, there's a film called The Signal, which once again, going back to the conversation that we just fucking had half an hour ago about films being named the same name, uh, there's already, there's, I think there's already a couple films called The Signal. I actually reviewed one on another review channel a couple years ago called The Signal. It came out, I believe, in 2010 or 11, which is a really good fucking movie, in my opinion. Uh, this one right here is called The Signal, and it's featuring Lawrence Fishburne and Brent, <laughs> Brenton Thwaites or something. I don't know. Uh, this one looks like it is a space type film. So hmm. I hate space movies. You know, I to be honest, man, some of them are really, really good though. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. I don't really know what to think of this one. Lawrence Fishburne. I don't know. Yeah, Cowboy Curtis. <laughs> so that's, that's an interesting one. But once again, the film is called The Signal. Like, why? Lawrence Fishburne's been in. That's a some, stupid title. Wasn't... It's so basic. Wasn't Lauren it's Fishburne fucking, in the? There's already a f- fucking movie's called The Signal. Like seriously, wasn't Lauren Fishburne in like The Colonies? That's what it's called. But, like that came out a few months ago. It's part- I think he's I, yeah, he's been in a few lower budget type yeah. horror films and stuff. So over the years, but um, but yeah. So that's gonna do. It. J- uh, JP, did you have any others? Um, just a few that are on my source that I, I'm not sure if they're horror, but uh, Defiance season two. That's a sci-fi show is coming out mm-hmm. on blu-ray and the 100 the complete first season is coming out on blu-ray and then there's one other one um looks just as generic it seems like there's one of these every week and it's called paranormal captivity <laughs> paranormal captivity yeah and there's like it's like a kind of a blue cover and it has like a ghostly looking little girl on some steps and it, yeah, i swear I there's like one those. of these like every week that comes out yeah i have a lot of them Oh my god! Seriously, yeah, it looks found footage ish, <laughs> probably. Oh, of course, found footage. Par- oh fuck! Yeah, there's there wow. at least has to be one of these every week. What was the one last week? Do you remember? Uh, I know what. <sighs> oh, Asylum of the Dead. Yeah, yeah, that's it, dude. Like, I mean, there there's another one coming out called The Paranormal Diaries. <laughs> like, like seriously, is that what it, is that what's going on these days? You have to put paranormal in every fucking film title. Well, it's just what it is. You have to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's fucking, it's fucking stupid. I'm surprised Ugh. there hasn't been a paranormal captivity yet. That just seems like um, what uh, instead of paranormal entity, the asylum. It seems like that's what they would have went with, right? Paranormal captivity. <laughs> paranormal captivity. Ah, <laughs> oh, shit, man. That just that cracks me up. That's all from my source. So that's all you got there. Okay, yep. so continue along with mood swings. Wait, I had. Wait, a- I want to say something. Oh, okay. So last week we talked about that Bates Motel set, and uh, mm-hmm. I know Sack today posted on the Facebook page, and he showed <laughs> off the set. The set is on a single disc. It's not a flipper disc, so that means that four movies on one DVD. It's not a flipper disc, and from his reports, the Bates Motel looks like a '80s VHS rip that something that Echo Bridge would put out. So. <laughs> kind of gets down on my shit about picking up that set now. Yeah, I'm still going to grab that set simply because that's the only other way besides the DVD-R version. Um, so, yeah. If I it want to like, complete the series, I'm going to have to grab that. You know, the price is really cheap, too. I've seen it as cheap as, like, 7 bucks. So, yeah. I mean, really, fuck, I don't know. I'm contemplating on grabbing it, too, just because I want that. But really, VHS, like, you know, 80s VHS quality? Nice. Yeah. So that's, that's interesting. All right. So um, I was having a conversation with one of my friends uh, a few days back and uh, he, he was, he was kind of joking to me about, um, about zombie film. I mean, we've covered this lots of times about how zombie films have just completely oversaturated the market. There's a, there's a new zombie apocalypse type film out pretty much every week, kind of like with the paranormal films now. Um, but he, you know, he said that's like the obvious choice for, you know, the subgenre of horror that's totally kind of played out, you know, zombie films and stuff like that. In your guys' opinion, what is the next subgenre of horror films that you feel that are just like completely oversaturated and just mm. needs to like kind of just kind of needs to recede a little bit? 
Um, I got on the – we started talking about found footage films and stuff. And no, not found footage. I don't really think found footage either. And then like – but my thing was was actually home invasion films. Mm. There, It seems to be – there's so fucking many of them. I just um, don't think – Or I maybe possession films. Like what are your guys' thoughts? Well, possession films have been oversaturated for a few years now already. So I'm not going to say that. But yeah, yeah. I think we haven't seen it yet to be completely honest. I was going to piggyback right off of that answer. I think that I think we're about due for the next saw or the next yeah. paranormal activity within the next couple of years. Something's going to come out that's just going to blow the doors off of you know. The, I think the, the purge genre. did that, man. To be completely honest, I think that is, I haven't, that is I haven't, home invasion, right? I mean, mm, kind of. I haven't I haven't seen the sequel yet, but I think I think we're going to see purge three, and you know, it's just going to keep on going. But that's just my opinion. What we're gonna well, see yeah, right that now. film really appeals to the mainstream audience of not horror, yeah. but just you know the mainstream moviegoers out there. Mm-hmm. And it, it's not a good movie, the first one. So th- that one, I'm really hoping no. that's not it. I'm, I'm, I think there's going to be something bigger though. Something I, I do agree with you to an ext- extent, Jeremy, that that is the film right now. But mm-hmm. there's going to be something bigger. It happens every you know 10 15 plus years it's gonna happen again soon and i I can't wait for it to happen actually i think i think we actually talked about this one time about the purge film you know turning into like a franchise because um of all the possibilities that you can do with it i mean in the first film it was obviously like a a home invasion type film and then the second one takes it to the streets but i think you could you know you could take it to fucking jail you could take it to like secluded like you could do a whole pile of things with this and just kind of change up the setting for every type of purge film, I think there's a lot of films that you could possibly do there. Now, what it's about Insidious? Though? Insidious. Insidious, yeah. I, um, I think we're. I think we'll probably see an Insidious four after Insidious three. Yeah, but I mean that genre has been, you know, relevant for a long time. It, I don't really yeah, yeah. feel like it is oversaturated, the hauntings and stuff. But it, it's kind of never went down or up. It's kind of been at the same pace for a long time. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I don't. Yeah, I'm going to go with the purge, yeah. that one. Yeah, I mean, how many films does it take for a film series to be considered a franchise? Is it four? Four. 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 I mean, three. You can arguably say that it's a trilogy. I, I think I'm that- going to go off of that a bit and say if it has something that's iconic, like a Victor Crowley, then it becomes a franchise. But if it's just three films, like a trilogy, I, I think that it, it's not a franchise yet. But I think there are exceptions, like the Hatchet. For I would consider Hatchet a franchise. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. You know, with an iconic character like Victor Crowley, but it, it, in my opinion, it's still type. It's still kind of a trilogy. I think if they make a fourth one, it's just a bona fide franchise. That's just the way I see it. But you know, I mean, I'm sure everyone's got an answer for that. Um, yeah, if, if you guys want to answer that, actually, I'm curious. <laughs> yeah, and also, also, I we, we kind of forgot to mention this, but definitely answer the question that Moods asked earlier: Which sequels do you like better than the original? Um, yeah, I think that's an interesting thing because I've actually heard people say that they prefer Halloween two over the original. I mean, a lot of people are like, "Well, that's that's blasphemy right there," but um, I have heard people say that. Yeah. So, know? and I've, you know, I've heard people say they like the stepfather two more than the first one. So, you know, these are just examples. But uh, I mean, I'm, there's obviously sequels out there. I mean, I'm talking direct sequels too. Yeah. So fill the comments up with those questions. Those two. And uh, mm-hmm. I'll throw a third one in there because I actually wanted to briefly t- touch on this. I was going around just looking at some trailers earlier today um, of of horror films, and I'm actually curious. Like, what what guys? What do you think is uh, like one of the better horror trailers out there? Because I was watching the Elm Street three trailer, and I actually really like that trailer. And I'm kind of looking for the ones that go against a normal trailer. The ones that done something a little bit different. I think of like the Stephen King one or the Hitchcock ones. Uh, the Stephen King one from Maximum Overdrive where he's like, you know, talking to the camera and he's like, for years people have done Stephen King, but you know, I need to do it damn right if, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna, if it needs, if it's gonna be done right, I need to do it myself or something. You know, and then there's the Hitchcock ones obviously that are just amazing. They're just unconventional. So what are some good trailers out there? Cause I've seen different ones like that, uh, Leatherface, Chainsaw 3 comes to mind. Just something different. Um, so yeah, what are some great trailers out there, guys? I want to look up some more of these. Hmm. Mm, I, uh, I would have like to think ju- about it. Just in general? 
like you know, like newer ones or older? Like, just or any just trailer at all? It's something that's I'm looking for something mm. that's kind of just not your typical trailer. Um, but even yeah, if yeah. it is your typical trailer, what are the good ones? I'm asking like the audience out there, but you know, you mm. guys can answer too. You know, I, I've actually been, it's funny that you bring this up because I've been on like a trailer kick right now, like not watching, you know, individual trailers on YouTube or whatever, but I've been watching compilation, you know, DVDs and Blu-rays Those of the trailer, cool. like, like older trailers, like Festival. the 42nd Street forever. Like, you know, it, it's like four hours of fucking trailers and it covers everything from, I, I already talked about this, but it's like exploitation and horror and sci-fi and like straight to like, you know, porno and shit like that. These trailers are fucking outrageously funny. Like the older trailers, the way they're done, it's just priceless. But I recommend things like that. Like I like older trailers, the way they're done, the way they're voiced over and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, do you remember but, the Elm Street three trailer? Uh, I honestly, I can't say I do. I haven't watched them in so long. Like I just think, like if I would have seen it when I was a kid, man, it would have just been like, like oh my god, that was just like scary and just I want to see it because it, it's it's just a girl sitting in a room like with the like little like like nursery rhymes singing. And then it's just like Freddy pops up and he's like, Freddy's back. And it's like, it's scary. So I want to say that I want to say that uh, I think one trailer that comes to mind that was kind of weird and different was. But then again, the film is also weird and different, too, is was Jacob's Ladder. I think the trailer completely doesn't say anything in it. I think it's Jacob's Ladder. I can't remember completely, but I remember. Yeah, the, the movie's fucking weird. It's a really, really good film. But I remember the trailer just being think that's the one i'm trying to think of but just totally offbeat you know the strangers so. had a really good trailer as well that one's more conventional but it's still a really good trailer yeah i remember the i remember the strangers trailer fuck yeah. i love that movie oh, we already yeah. talked about that <laughs> so yeah um but anyways getting back to that original question um my answer would be <laughs> which i was kind of laughing about uh, you know, with all the possession films that, you know, the paranormal and blah, blah, blah. I think possession films are just like, just fucking, just oversaturating everything, man. And I know it's been like that for a few years, but it just seems like they're not going away. Like paranormal everything. You know, it was kind of funny that you brought up that paranormal captivity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just fucking just made me laugh because I was, I was actually getting to that, you know, in a minute. And, uh, but I don't know. There's something about possession films that are just rubbing me the wrong way. Yeah, there um, are a lot of them. The there's so many of them. And stuff that, that come out every year. I, I yeah. kind of avoid them, to be honest. Like, I don't even report that much on the news. I don't pay attention to the news. Don't even get me started I don't with watch those, them man. when they come out, usually, unless I hear something good about one. Mm-hmm. Those mm-hmm. are the last IFC Midnight films I'm picking up are all the possession ones because I refuse to buy them. Mm-hmm. I refuse to do it. I fucking hate them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I probably dislike more of them than I actually like of of them. But there is some good ones. But, I mean, anything with paranormal in the title is, now, it just seems like it's almost like a joke. Like, I can't even tell when these films come out, like, Paranormal Captivity, if that's going to be, like, a spoof film. Because, yeah. you know, there's all these paranormal whatever fucking spoof films and stuff. I don't even know what's serious anymore. So, but, yeah. Um, did you have anything else on that, guys? No. Nope. No? Okay, um, just before the show, I was like flipping through this Rue Morgue magazine before I get to the uh, Rue Morgue fact of the day. Um, and I noticed that, you know, this is something that we've covered before and maybe not so much our thoughts on it, but we just talked about how it just seems to be coming up. Like everyone's kind of doing this. It started with Netflix, obviously with streaming and stuff. And then, you know, Full Moon has their streaming and stuff like that. And I think they're pa- Full Moon's paired up with what, Blue Underground now? Yeah. Yeah, and, and um, uh, something weird. And something weird. So... The catalog of films on on that streaming is pretty fucking cool. You got to admit, though, there's some really good shit on there. But anyways, I was kind of flipping through this month's um, Rue Morgue, which actually is covering the Eli Ross, the Green Inferno. There's a pretty good article on it and stuff in here. Um, but I noticed that there's another uh, streaming um, site coming up, and it's the InstantWarnerArchive.com. So, and I'm assuming this is like mm. a lot of obviously just Warner films, but maybe it's a lot of their back catalog that's never been released and stuff. So, yeah, there, I mean, a lot of those people, DVDRs, huh? Exactly, exactly. And, those and, you know, expensive things. Exactly. We talked about this before, and they're like all like fifteen to twenty bucks for a DVDR. Um, and I'm not saying they're not bad; they're bad quality or anything, because I actually have a couple of them myself, and the quality is quite surprisingly, shockingly good. Um, but. Uh, yeah, so I, I thought this was quite interesting because Warner does have a lot of films sitting in their catalog that kind of need to be seen. 
So, I mean, for the people out there that, that are, you know, interested in streaming and, you know, watching films like that and stuff, I, I generally only stream films when I'm, you know, like on holidays or whatnot and stuff. And it's just an easy way to watch a film, you know, on Netflix or whatnot. But it's really what I do. So it's um, going to be a monthly service like Netflix and Full Moon Streaming? Or is it you know, partnered with something? You know, to be honest, it actually doesn't say really anything. It, it says try for one month. You know, it says there's obviously no commercials, blah, blah, blah. Stuff like that, but um, yeah, so it's available on Apple TV, shit like that. But yeah, I'm assuming it's just a monthly fee, mm. probably very similar to Netflix and Full Moon streaming. Is there any other streaming sites that are Amazon you know, with your Prime? Amazon. Yeah. Oh, Amazon. There, there's Prime, a yeah. couple other ones. On there's com. one called Something Horror, like it's specifically horror films, but it's kind mm-hmm. of like the same stuff you'd probably see on Crackle and some yeah. of the other alternatives to Netflix. Um, according, like the only like official one that I know that is is kind of exclusive is the Full Moon streaming. They they kind of went out and uh, found these um, libraries from like Blue Underground something. Where I'm sure they're going to add more lib. Uh, they're going to try to make deals with other other people. Um, you know, Charlie Ban. You know, mm-hmm. he's always trying to stay relevant and and mm-hmm. you know <laughs> use it using the technology. Man, I mean, he got his films in Redbox. You, you got to give him credit for uh, his his just skills with, you know, staying uh, on top of what's the new thing. Yeah. 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 And I believe that full moon streaming is actually available in the foreign land of Canada. I've um, actually I, tried I, it, I, but you I, have to pay eighty nine ninety nine for shipping. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to pay a ridiculous amount for shipping. <laughs> um, but yeah, cause like we, you know, this week's main review was supposed to be the battery and um, my copy of the battery never shipped from Amazon. In time, so we actually had to, you know, change up the main review this week. Um, but you know, uh, for the people out there that don't know the story, the, JP and Jeremy are like, well, just you know, stream it on Amazon.com and or I can't. any other I, rental place. Any other rental place, pretty much ninety nine percent of the places do not stream to Canada. You have to be U.S. or in the U.S. and stuff. And I was like, holy shit! And I couldn't find one place in Canada that was actually streaming it. Like, I went to iTunes, like all that shit. They didn't didn't even have the fucking movie on there. So I was like, wow, this is really a first for me I, that I actually can't find a film right now. Google um, Play. He tried all the outlets to rent this it was, film. Yeah, it was so crazy, and I just it would not let me it's do it because I'm Anchor Bay up there, right? Yeah, and. uh yeah, the DVD. It's so so fucking random. Um, my buddy Dylan bought it, and I said to him, "I was like, did you notice that that's released by Anchor Bay?" And he or and he's like, "Yeah, it's fucking random." <laughs> but I don't yeah. understand that at all. So, but yeah, just getting back to the battery, like I could not locate this film to have a watch. To, you know, even stream it for the re- for the review this week. Um, very very odd, very yeah. odd. So, so so basically, what what I'm getting at is that if you're in Canada, we're kind of limited on the streaming type deals. Like we have our Netflix, but our Netflix is not even near what the American one is. Uh, when I was in Vegas a couple of weeks ago, I clicked on to Netflix, and it just reminded me of like how much more films you guys have on there. <laughs> there must be ten times more. It's fucking incredible. So I'm just like I'm like a little kid in a candy store. I'm like fuck yeah, I'm gonna watch this. Fuck yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm like what? I'm in <laughs> Vegas. I can't be watching fucking movies on Netflix. Come on. <laughs> um, but you know what I'm saying. But I, I'm just like up here. We, we're very limited on our streaming and so you know if you ever come to this issue you know might possibly happen to you too so so but the, yeah but anyways the main point i was trying to make instant warner archive.com i'm not 100 percent sure if you can get a subscription to that if you're in canada um because it is a dot com thing so sorry for the you know the us foreign canadians <laughs> yeah <laughs> if you can't and i'm here i'm trying to promote this but i i think it's you know it's an interesting idea anyways or europeans but. yeah i would look at it but also you know just to kind of touch on that thing with the, the the battery the reason that you didn't get your copy in time is because shout factory does not send amazon ca enough copies for the people who pre-order it so our idea behind doing the battery yeah. is any film that's going to be released by scream factory that's new like a uh what, uh, yeah, there's a word for it. I can't remember it, but yeah, any of those films that come out that aren't you know classics, uh, we plan on covering, and we plan on covering them the day, the week of release. But if this issue you know keeps going, then we might have to do it you know two weeks after release or whatever. But it, somebody needs to get something together, whether it's Amazon or Shout Factory, because it's kind of BS, dude. I mean, like. It's annoying. Yeah, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was really disappointed about that. And you know, the fucked up thing is, my shit still hasn't shipped. <laughs> my my projected sh- or uh, date or whatever is like October fifteenth or some shit. What? I'm like, what the fuck is like? What is Scream Factory doing? Like, they're not sending. Like, I mean, it, it, like, how many people ordered that shit up here that they can't get shit for like a month? <laughs> I'm like, I'm so confused by this. Stuck you know, at the this, border. But the thing is, you know, I, I pre-order a lot of stuff on Amazon and, you know, I, I pre-order a lot of Screen Factory stuff. And m- the films that do get, you know, delayed for me are always Screen Factory releases. So it, it is something to do with them, which is really, really irritating because those are the ones that I usually want the most. Yeah, the contemporary but, uh, titles. That's the word I was yeah. looking for contemporary yeah and it, it's just really irritating me that you know oh did your copy ship no it's like two days after the release date it still hasn't shipped and i'm like fuck again mm. like that many that many fucking people ordered lake placid <laughs> and i think i got my copy of the battery before the re- release date actually so yeah and, you know and oh, fuck it. i'm so i'm just agitated by it it's just it's really fucking annoying me yeah we are still but, covering it though it'll just be a little bit of yeah a yeah, we're we're gonna have to update the uh, the spreadsheet once I get that copy. You know, hopefully mid October, maybe Halloween time. I don't know. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> um. Yeah. So for the uh, coroner's report this week, weird stats and morbid facts presented by Room Morgue Magazine, Canada's own magazine. Um. I'm taking it from this month, so uh, there were some pretty decent ones on here, but I thought this was quite actually funny. Um. <laughs> So on May 22nd of this year, in a northern French town of Longway, a female Hannibal Lecter killed her 80-year-old husband with a kitchen martyr, then cooked his heart, nose, and genitals. She was sent to prison, psychiatric unit to undergo tests. What, what a weird combination of food to eat, nose, Why genitals, and heart. That's exactly... Dogs? That's what I I was like, what? The heart in the nose? Why would you fucking eat his nose? Yeah, that's just weird. Dude, I, I mean, the balls. Yeah, okay, I can see crazy but people doing like, that. Did you, like, crack heart. open, like, eggs or something? It's like, geez. I don't know, man, but I. that's why I thought it was interesting. Her choice of uh, um, human appendages and stuff. Uh, fucking random. <laughs> <laughs> but I, lo- I love these things. I like how this happened this year. And with <laughs> fucking 80-year-old. <laughs> How does one her- eat a nose? Ugh, God, I don't. <laughs> ew, that's really gross. They pulled a South Park it. Michael Jackson, man. Yeah, Smell right man. off his face. Ah, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's. I guess that's going to do it for uh, for mood swings. Um, questions. Yes, the questions. Uh, JP, do you have the questions up? I do have them. Uh, so yeah, um, this week we didn't get that many questions again. Like I really want you guys to like send us more questions because they're really fun to answer. So, mm-hmm. so get on that. Zach's usually good for sending in a question. Um, and his question is, as far as movie hunting goes, what three movies would you consider your holy grail movies of movie hunting? Three per each of you. Moods, go ahead. You go first. Okay. Um yeah, I recently knocked off a couple films that I really wanted forever. Um, so I'm going to leave those off the list. But uh, the first one I'm going to mention here is an Anchor Bay release. I believe it came out in like early, early 2000s. It was one of the early releases. And that is Nightmares. Um, that DVD is fucking hard to find. It's really, really rare. And I, I just, I want that film. And I mean, I really hope it gets a re-release. I mean, we've talked about this before, but... You know, I, I'm sure once I find a copy of this, it'll get a re-release the next day. Mm-hmm. Like, it always fucking happens to me. Yeah. Um, I, I just recently, me and Jeremy, found Splatter University. And not, like, two weeks later, um, 88 Films is releasing the Blu-ray. Oh, That's really? what happened with me with Scarecrows. Man. Oh, you didn't tell me that, dude. <laughs> yeah, I actually it's totally forgot. Well, it was actually, it was posted on, um, it was posted in the in the Facebook group page. Uh, the titles that 88 Films was releasing was actually incredible. Like those movie, those four titles that I just never thought ever would hit Blu-ray. But of course, one of them was Splatter University, which I thought was pretty. But you have the funny. rare elite edition coming, so that's good. Yeah, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. So um, next up is another Anchor Bay release, and that is the Ilsa box set. Mm, um, that's I, a I have great wanted, pick. Yeah. I have wanted this for fucking ever, and the prices are ridiculous on it. Like it never seems to drop in price. Um, I would like to see, you know, that same set re-released, but, um, I don't know. 
I'd, I'd really like to find that set, you know, with that Have original you seen those logo. Um, I've seen, I've seen a couple of the Elsa films. I can't even remember which ones are actually in the set. I know the Wicked Warden's in there, and um, I've seen the first one on DVDR, and I, I really yeah. liked it. Oh, I, I yeah, Elsa, yeah, it's awesome. Um, actually, another <laughs> release uh, by Anchor Bay is a film called Fright. Uh, it's from 1971. It's a really, really fucking obscure uh, release by Anchor Bay. Um, another really early release. Um, I wanted. I've really only ever seen one or two people ever show this off. One of them being that uh, Tom Terra for Tom found a copy for pretty cheap, but it's really fucking hard to find. And I threw in a you know just kind of a bonus one, and I I said Clown House. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah, Clown House is too. really like if I ever came across a copy of Clown House, I'd probably shit my pants literally, because that shit is super super rare. Because we all know the story behind that. That shit got pulled off shelves like right after it got released, and there's only a bunch of copies out there. Um, but yeah, Clown House. That's pretty much kind of like the holy grail of collecting, besides Ilsa for me. But yeah, those are those are mine. And my next. Go ahead. All right. So my first one was, of course, Evil Led, which I found a copy uh, about a year ago for buck fifty at Family Video. And like Moot said, I just about shat my pants when I found it. Yeah, uh, I actually forgot about Evil Led. Fuck, I, I could have had that on there. That too. was like my holiest, Such a holy, hard film to find. holiest, holiest grail, and I found a copy of that. So that Clown House, of course. I mean, I I have to have that on that list. It's I, I want it so bad, but you know. I want Tales from the Hood pretty bad as well. Mm-hmm. That's another one that I want. I don't know. I think that's it. Is that three? Yeah, that's three. Yeah. yeah. Um, for me personally, you know, Clown House was one that I didn't consider. I don't know why because that's definitely would be in my top three probably. Um, Tales from the Hood, like Jeremy said, that that's more of a personal find that I would just be really happy to oh, wait. find. And Mosquito. Sorry. Well. <laughs> exactly mosquito was my number one choice um i love that film and it would just be so awesome to find that i would never find that i'm hoping it gets mm-hmm. re-released eventually it probably will everything does I, at least i think so eventually <laughs> yeah um but that's a good that's a good choice i never can cons- i never thought of mosquito but uh yeah that's one that i've actually yet to see myself um talked about that before but it's definitely that's a really really fucking rare obscure release like yeah, yeah. it's definitely right up there with clown house it's released so. by image too fucking yeah answer. yeah that's right so that's an old release it was like yeah. 1999 or something mm-hmm. yeah so clown house mosquito tells from the hood those three mm-hmm. cool next question uh, the next question is from Emperor Sea Dog, and he says, "What are three horror films you guys like that most horror <laughs> other horror fans generally do not like?" Oh, Taxi Chainsaw 3D. <clears throat> oh man, I was I was making this list today, and I was literally laughing to myself. <laughs> I was telling this story earlier, and I'm like, I know all of JP's picks right now. <laughs> I, I I wonder if I actually got them right, but I'll go first here. Um, my first one is probably the Blair Witch Two. I know, I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but I know a lot of people really dislike this film. Um, but I find it, I find it good. I find it entertaining. Um, what can I say? It's Blair Witch Two. Another film that I know a lot of people dislike. They find it shitty, uh, and that's the Howling Part Two. <laughs> The ending so, credits for that movie, man. So many people hate this film, and I fucking love it. It's so sleazy, sleazy and bad. It's just a, it's a terrible film that's really highly enjoyable to watch. Um, what can I say, man? There's some great tits in that film. Oh, yeah. um, and then uh, my third one, actually, I just realized this, um, which is Amityville Three. I know everybody hates this movie. I find it to be oddly enjoyable. That's, weird. For, that's a weird I know. choice. It is. But I picked it because everybody seems to hate this movie. Um, nobody, like, you hear the odd person say they don't mind it and stuff, but it's a terrible movie, but it's oddly enjoyable. And I get, I, I can watch it. Like, you know, I've watched it a few times. So I don't know. What can I say? Yeah. Um, I guess I'll go next. Uh, <laughs> Paranormal Activity is what? one. Uh, I really like the first Paranormal Activity. It's oh, it's a great gotta movie. Kind of bite my tongue here. 
Um, and until somebody effectively argues that it's not a great movie and convinces me otherwise, I- I'm still going to go with it's a great movie. Uh, Texas Chainsaw 3D is definitely <laughs> one. And I don't even, uh, I still don't understand this. The stupid timeline <laughs> people complain about when every damn timeline and every Texas Chainsaw after all of them <laughs> was weird. And, and yeah, not but, right. But you have to you have to admit though, 3D is really goofy. Yeah, it's really goofy. The timeline. Right yeah, it's not 20, goofy. It's just it, twenty years after the original events. Yeah, that's goofy. It's not that goofy, dude. It, it's it's literally it would, just it would be a setting, detail. Be, it's a detail that. The, mid nineties, mid nineties, but this is present day, and we've yeah, got like the only reason for that is because it, probably a cost thing to set it in in mid nineties. It, it would just take a little bit more preparing and stuff. It's not a big deal. I mean, when when does Texas Chainsaw Four take place? It it, it they, first they say that like half the it doesn't even make sense at all. Um, and yeah, but, you know when does Texas Chainsaw Three take place? How come Ken Forey can die and come back to life? Like these have he's been Ford. problems throughout the entire series, but I don't hear people complaining about them because they look at these films from the point of view of years after they came out instead of, you know. Okay, I I understand your point, but I mean, it was just it is just oddly put though. I mean, it speci- specifically says like twenty years after that puts you into the mid nineties, and it's like I don't know, man. It just it's not really that big of a deal. Like I don't really actually even mind Texas Chainsaw 3D, but um, <laughs> it's know. just a little continuity it, detail that's messed up. It, it doesn't bug me at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, Texas Chainsaw 3D, and and the other one that I was gonna pick was Blair Witch and Blair Witch 2. Either of those, I know more people like Blair Witch one, but Blair Witch 2 is fantastic. I love that movie, so I'm right with you on that one, Moods. Yeah. Um, I kind of I kind of figured. I knew you were going to say Texas Chainsaw 3D, but what I was kind of other figured ones? the other ones that I had in mind was Friday Five and Friday Nine, and Elm Street Two, and Elm Street Two, and that was the other one that I had listed. I shit you not, which yeah. Blair Witch Two and Texas. So those are like all the ones that I had in my mind. Yeah, those are all probably the other ones I would have picked. the The thing is that, like I was explaining this earlier to you, is because of the fire, almost probably 85% of my DVDs are packed away. So I have a hard time like going through and, and and remembering these films without being able to just look down my shelves and and pick out these films for these questions. So I apologize Mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jeremy. So, all right. My top three are number one, Halloween six. So Halloween six usually gets shat on. It's be one of the worst of the series next to resurrection. But I actually like it quite a lot. Yeah, me too. I think it's a fun film. Mm. I like the head explosion. Uh, Pinocchio's Revenge. It's <laughs> 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 another movie that gets shot on a lot, like Jack Frost. But it's oh. just so goofy that to the to this day, to, like to this day, I'm still kind of disappointed with myself that I didn't bring my coffee copy of uh, Pinocchio's Revenge to get Kevin Tenney to sign. Yeah. Remember I was joking about that at Wasteland? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I should totally bring Pinocchio's Revenge. And you know what the funny thing is? That was the only movie that he didn't have for sale out of his horror films mm-hmm. at his <laughs> table was Pinocchio's Revenge. I fucking thought that was funny. He even had Brain Dead on there. Yeah. I was like, that's so fucking funny. <laughs> and Saw 3. It's another one. Which is my favorite of the series, really, after the first one, but... That's another one that gets kind of shat on a hmm. little bit. You should just put the whole Saw series in there. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't like everyone after three, so... Yeah. So, yeah. That's it. Hmm. All right, cool. Um, the never-ending Gory, uh, he says, commentaries. Do you watch them? What are some that you have enjoyed or ones to avoid? If you could do one or two commentaries, which movies would they be and Why? Uh, See, if you'll, I, I'll let you tackle this. Yeah, you I probably watch a lot more yeah. commentaries. I don't watch a lot of commentaries that much unless the film is like – unless I'm – I don't know. 
I will so. say I used to love commentaries back in probably 2003 to 2009. I was a commentary junkie. I've listened to so many commentaries. I actually forget which ones I have listened to and which ones that I haven't listened to. Uh, it's definitely slowed down over the past couple of years. The only ones that I've been listening to are for the ones the Scream Factory releases for those reviews that I do. Um, mm-hmm. But I really want to get back into listening to commentaries. It's just so hard because you have to watch the film again. And, you know, there's plenty of stuff that, that I haven't seen yet that I, I still need to watch. So, yes, uh, commentaries, I, I really recommend Eli Roth's commentaries. I think they're really entertaining. Uh, he gives a lot of insight into the films. And specifically, if you grab the Cabin Fever special edition, there's like five commentaries on that uh, film. So I recommend listening to all those commentaries. They're, they're really good. He talks about his early you know watching horror films throwing up in the theater watching alien working with <laughs> in trauma and stuff like that um i i really learned to love eli roth from those commentaries as a person like i i like who he is and i lo- know a lot of people don't so maybe give his uh commentaries a try ones mm-hmm. to avoid um really the ones to avoid are just the ones where people are very monotone and and just walking you through the film i know wes craven does this sometimes where they're just talking about um what's happening on screen which nobody wants to hear that right i mean yeah yeah. what goes on behind the scenes is what you want to hear but not actually what's happening um Mm -hmm. another good one uh is the commentaries from toby hooper on chainsaw 2 and for uh, the – if there was two films that I wanted to do a commentary on, I think the Hellraiser 1 film would be a really fun commentary to do. Um, have you guys ever thought about doing commentaries? About doing them? Yeah, I know other podcasts have, have done that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean pick a you know a film that I really want to you know talk about and stuff and yeah, fucking give her. There's a fourth question for the listeners out there. Would you guys ever want to hear us try to do a commentary or attempt to do one, see how it turns out? Yeah. Uh, any films that you would particularly like to do, Moods or Jeremy? Um, that was a man. I don't. I, I think. I think a fun one for me and well, at least for me and you, JP, would be uh, Dream Warriors Three. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah. Jer- I, I'm sure. Dream Warriors Three, <laughs> uh, Nightmare Three. Um, but. Uh, Jeremy, are you a big fan of that film? I'm not a big fan of the Nightmare series in general, to be completely honest. I know you, you're you dying inside for that. Oh, I, I mean, I could care less, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, mean, my, it's my favorite of the series, to be completely honest. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be I, a great one. I've been hearing, it's funny, I've been hearing a lot of people say that recently, that how much they don't really care for the Nightmare series all that much. And I'm like, what the fuck? I know, but man. I it, it, it's series. odd for me because they was always my favorite franchise. Right. And I just kind of always just assume that people really did enjoy it. But Abby just hearing a lot more, I guess, honest opinions about it now and stuff. I I, I don't really know why, but you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't kill. Well, maybe me I have to give them another like, watch or something. I have the it, shitty set that you always bitch about. So <laughs> yeah. Oh man. That fucking Blu-ray set. Ugh. God, yeah, seriously. So, Elm Street but, uh, three no, and Hellraiser. Yeah, I mean those would be really fun films to do. Is it, would is there anything that you would like to do, Jeremy? Mm. Like something that you would really like, you know, just have some random insight or. It's got to be something, man. Like, hmm. I think doing like anything from a major franchise would be quite fun. Yeah, um, Friday Five, dude. That would be funny as hell. <laughs> I think Father's Day would be a fun movie to do. Oh, that would be a fucking weird one. Yeah. Or Manborg. I mean, honestly, the the possibilities are endless. I mean, maybe we should try it one day and and see how it turns out. Should we do the taint moods? <laughs> oh my god. Man, then we'd have to count how many times we said penis in the in the commentary. Yeah, a, a penis counter. Yep, penis like a punk with the shit counters, like yeah. Yeah. in the bottom corner. Have a penis counter. <laughs> I mean, I think the three of us talking about pretty much any movie would would be funny. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, there's definitely like some that I would really, really enjoy doing. I think Dream Warriors is one that just automatically comes to my mind. I think that'd yeah. be a blast. So, all right. Um, the next uh, question comes from Couple Sentence Reviews. Could you do a quick review of Ace Eraserhead? I have not seen it, so one of you guys, quick 
review. Racerhead is a weird ass fucking movie <laughs> that unless you are on acid or drugs, you probably shouldn't watch. Or if you're like uh, weird movies with weird sound effects, basically it's about a guy who is he lives in this world that's pretty much dysfunctional and run by giant factories. Uh, he's married and he gets his girlfriend knocked up and she gives birth to a deformed child and he basically it's almost like an alien though it's not even like a baby yeah and he has an affair with the lady across the hall and he basically complicates killing the child and that's pretty much it (laughs) and there's just there's a lot of random shit in this film too man like the the singing the singing fucking lady um, lots, ugh, of, lots of like sperm effects and it's just weird really really <laughs> cool I, one of my favorite things about Eraserhead is the setting it, it's got that industrial setting um, the soundtrack is just like it's it's an amazing 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 film and that everyone who's interested in yeah. the film should watch it just because it's it's amazing it's, yeah David Lynch's usage of you know the sounds like in the industrial scenes and stuff is just fucking brilliant man it really does kind of create this almost surreal feel to it um but you never quite know exactly what you're watching. It, the the film basically is like a, uh, it's like a fucking nightmare mm-hmm. is what it is. It, essentially, that's what you could say about it. It's just like this really, really odd nightmare. And I noticed I th- when I was like watching it again, he rarely uses any cuts. It's a very low cut type of a movie. So mm-hmm. he takes his time and he evolves the scenes out without really cutting. And if he does cut, you know, it, they're pretty quick cuts. Mm-hmm. You're pretty. Yeah. You're mainly just for focus on. I think his name's Henry. The entire movie. The one of the weirdest scenes in the film is when he goes to his uh, his girlfriend's or his wife's house, yeah. parents' house for dinner, or whatever. And you know, he obviously you know kind of puts his fork into that little chicken wing. Yeah, and, and it moves. Shit's, oh fuck, man! Have you it's seen like one his, of the, Have you seen the short film on the ABCs before? Um, I don't know. Oh, you need to check it out, man! It is fucking strange as hell man it's so weird though <laughs> yeah pretty much everything about Eraserhead is is really brilliant um it, i think one of the coolest things about Eraserhead too is david lynch i think it took him like five or six years to make that film because he actually he actually built like all the sets himself right so he kept running out of money and just kept fucking getting more money and building these sets and shit so it took like all these years he was doing it when he, when he was in film school and all this shit and stuff so that that's kind of, kind of an interesting way to make a film like took place over such a long period and just to have that end product is quite impressive you know considering the actors you know went through years of uh development too right yeah, it's Su- such amazing, an amazing film. film. I really, really need is. to pick up that Criterion. I heard it's it's fucking beautiful. So uh, I just I, act- I can't wait to watch that film on yeah. Blu-ray. That's going to be fucking amazing. So yeah, so hopefully that uh, that works. Um, yeah, Eraserhead is. It's is a ten out of ten film for me. So just watch it. It's amazing. Yeah, it really is brilliant. Yeah. All right, so we have one more question, and it comes from uh, Dylan. He asks, what is your favorite giant monster movie? Oh, fucking hell. Oh, I guess I could pick one, I guess. Ah, huh. go ahead. That's a really, that's a good question. Troll Hunter. Troll Hunter. Hmm. I don't, I don't really watch many giant monster movies. That's the first one that popped into my mind. Uh, me, I, I'll go with Godzilla simply because I'm right yeah. with Jeremy. I have not seen very many giant monster movies that maybe only a handful cloverfield is another one that i really liked so those two giant monster films you know the, the first film that came to my mind was uh, the original godzilla film i love the tone of that film it's fucking yeah. great that um, I, and that is what like kind of bugged me about some of the sequels was like that tone is completely gone i've only seen the first four but man that t- the tone and like dark feel of that of that original film i really like it um, would you? I mean, would you consider the Blob remake to be a, a monster film? Yeah, I would consider that a giant monster. Speaking that of that, would be the hell of a choice. Movie, you forgot about that movie. That movie goes up for pre-order in two days from now on Wednesday oh. at oh my four God. p.m. You're not talking Eastern about time. this company. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I think I'm going to have to go with the Blob because if that's considered, a, I, I mean, it's obviously a giant monster, isn't it? Yeah. So the Blob remake, not to take anything away from, you know, the original Godzilla film from 54, uh, 
yeah, the the tone of that one. I just I really wish that they'd make another Godzilla film like that, where Godzilla's tearing some shit up. Yeah, awesome. You know, so um, yeah, that's interesting question. I, <laughs> of course, Dylan would ask that question too because you know he's the huge monster uh, freak man. He loves his giant monster films. I know, I know one film that he really loves is The Host. Have you guys seen The Host? I, I want to see that one. That that's one that I have not seen. The Host is a good film. It's actually really good. So I know that he always talks about that one and stuff. So, but uh, yeah, that's it for the questions. Awesome. So we are going to get into uh, reviews of the week here, um, or what we watched this week. That's what the segment is called, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. WWW. Um, who wants to go first? JP, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. I'll go first. Uh, the first film that I watched is The Vagrant. Did a review on it. This one is from 1990, what, two? Which I found very mm. weird because I was yeah. feeling like it felt a little bit older. Of course, it stars Bill Paxton. A businessman buys a home, but he has a hard time trying to get past the previous tenant, a dirty bum. So this film, to me, is like a weird mix of comedy, dark comedy, and horror. And I almost feel like they, they do go a bit overboard at times with the comedy. And that was, and they didn't for the majority of the beginning of the film. They there was a lot of like actual horror scenes, which I, I was enjoying. Uh, but this this vagrant is really just tormenting Bill Paxton's character, and it almost starts getting into that line where Bill Paxton thinks that he might be committing murders while he's sleeping because he is so messed. That paranoia up. factor. Yeah, but <laughs> I think they they didn't execute the paranoia factor super great. Um, I, I'm not sure. It almost feels like they didn't know if they really wanted to go down that route, and then they was kind of double guessing it a few times. Is this the first time you watched the movie? Yes. Yeah, it's interesting because if you watch this one again, you might. It's one of those films that seems to kind of get better with watches. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know for some weird reason. The first time I watched The Vagrant, which is years ago, I didn't actually really even care for it. Hmm. And then I've watched it a couple times since the Screen Factory release came out. And I actually, it's really kind of grown on me. I don't know. I find it's just, it's kind of interesting, but yeah, yeah it almost I, has I, I like know a where you're quirky from. feel to it, right? Oh, it totally does. Totally yeah. does. And I, I really like the setting of, of the film, like that, that house and like across the street, it almost had sort of like a, a burbs feel or like a house, the, the film house, like that, that type of hmm. feel to it a little bit. Um, and I really enjoy that feel. Uh, the vagrant was nasty and dirty and stuff. I, I like that. Bill Paxton's just fun to watch, man. I'm I'm glad I kind of watched this one because I, I never really heard about it at all. Especially when people talk about '90s horror, I never really heard anybody talk about this one. So that's mm -hmm. definitely uh, one to you know seek out and check out. And you can get it really cheap in that four pack put out by Scream Factory. I also found that. The uh, ending, I, I I really didn't care for like the big reveal of the vagrant and stuff, so that kind of knocked down a, a few points right there. Uh, I, I didn't feel like it really made that much sense, but then when you kind of compare it to the tone of the film, it, it kind of fits, uh, but I, I didn't really like that very much. Uh, overall, uh, I did really you know enjoy most of the film. I thought it got a little bit uh, out of bounds when it, when once he left the house, I felt like it, it started getting into that, you know, over the top territory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but besides that, uh, the, the first half of the movie is, is really good and really fun. I think the second half takes a step down overall. I probably give it a six out of uh, 10, no 6.5 out of 10. Hmm. Interesting. Am I going next? Yeah. All right. So, a movie that I watched this week was a Macabre Presents film, and it's titled Armstead's. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, is that is that from 2014? Uh, I think it got released in 2014, but it's from 2013 or 12, I think. Yeah, I, yeah, it's like yeah, it's one of those DVD releases. Okay. Yeah. So this is this is an interesting movie. It's about this guy who wakes up in this house. And he doesn't know how he got there or what's going on. And there's no way out of this house, you know. Um, he he can't get through the door. He can't break any of the windows or anything like that. 
And the first day he's just sitting there and he hears this bell and this giant monster or this giant creature comes out and attacks him. And he either dies himself or he has to kill this creature. This creature's really good. It's really practical effects. It's a real suit, person in a suit. It's really good. Real, you know, real gore and everything like that. So he kills this person. He kills this creature. And of course, he's a little mind strut. And then um, he goes to sleep. He wakes up the next day and he hears the bell again. And this creature comes again. He has to kill the creature again. And it just goes on and on and on every day. He has to kill this creature to survive. He either kills it or it kills him. And he's stuck in this house. And it's basically him just going into a downward spiral of insanity because he's stuck in this house by himself and he can't find things to do or anything like that. Um, and then there's a side story about this guy who was in this house too. And he's, you know, not to spoil or anything like that. But um, this movie was a little bit bit boring it's a character piece film for sure because considering there's only really one main character and a side character and besides that there's really nothing else um i had to give it a point for having practical effects and having a dude in a suit you know attacking this guy but it's just like you know groundhog's day you know every day he wakes Which up and he has i like that guy. uh story mm-hmm. but um, besides that, it's it's an okay film. It's I got bored of it pretty quickly because it's just the same shit every day, and this guy is going a downward spiral. I know some people really really liked it and enjoyed it. Gets good reviews from the mainstream audience and things like that, but really really didn't do it for me. Um, I'm just gonna give it an average five out of ten. Um, pick it up if you find it for cheap. It's not very good. I haven't been too impressed with that label to be honest. I've only seen the banshee chapter and uh that thompson's the The conspiracy is really really fucking good really good i highly recommend that it's really good all right there's actually some pretty good films released on there though yeah i like i've said i've only seen two i was really disappointed with the thompson or the the, yeah the hamilton sequel that one was awful yeah the thompson's yeah so moods you're up all right. Um, first film that I watched this week is a uh, film. I believe this is actually the very first horror film re- re- uh, released um, from Israel. Uh, it's from 2010. It's from the same directors that did uh, the newly released Big Bad Wolves film, and it's called Rabies. Have you guys heard of this film? Yeah, I actually remember yeah. getting quite a lot of buzz. One for being the first film from a uh, horror film from Israel, and two for being good, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah this movie is actually quite interesting. So it basically starts out with um, this couple, or this couple, this brother and sister, that are trapped in this like underground kind of layer thing that this killer is basically set up and trap them. Um, well trap the the sister anyways the guy's down there trying to her her brother's down there trying to get her out of this shit and stuff like that anyways he you know gets out of this hole and basically tries to seek out help and he comes across the the these two young couples that are kind of lost or whatever they're in this suv and whatnot um so he he runs into these uh to these couples and um basically what happens is he goes the two guys that are with um at this vehicle they go with this guy into the woods to go you know help find this fucking sister and get her out of there and stuff like that meanwhile while that while they're looking for the sister and trying to get her out the two girls are left at the vehicle and these cops show up and um (laughs) so these cops show up and uh they start harassing the shit out of these two girls like kind of like sex well this one cop is anyways harassing these girls and then it gets fucking completely out of control and whatnot and basically the whole film is like all these different people that are, you know, supposed to be doing this one thing, like getting this girl out of this hole where this killer is roaming the fucking woods and stuff like that. It becomes like this internal battle between all these characters and they start kind of turning on each other and stuff and creating this really odd tone to the film. And it's just like, it's fucking crazy, man. So, you know, it's basically the, without giving too much away, I don't want to give any scenes and stuff away, but, uh, that's basically what it is. It's like a bunch of different characters that are kind of all in different spots of this film in the same setting, in the same area that are just having like all these crazy issues and, and stuff like that. Um, the title rabies is quite interesting to, you know, 
the you know the final act of this film and whatnot, or just you know the development of the film, it makes a lot more sense once you watch it. This was a fucking fantastic movie. Really good gore. It's got a really unique type ending, and um, and really the you know the demise of some of the characters in this film are just fucking unbelievable. Uh, it's a really entertaining watch. It's really kind of unique and obscure. Uh, the the you know the structure to the film is really tight is really obscure because it's just you don't see films like this and especially how the ending comes about and stuff um really awesome watch man like some of the characters you just like holy fuck but uh you know you kind of feel for them at the same time because of what's going on um like i said i just don't want to give anything away this is one that you definitely got to check out i absolutely loved this film it was fantastically done really really good first effort from um these directors uh, I think this is their first film anyways. I could be mistaken, but the first film that come over here anyways. But uh, definitely check out Rabies. It's fucking phenomenal. Really, really good. I give it an 8.5 out of 10. Wow. I probably could give it even a 9 out of 10. Um, it's really, really well done. Uh, there's not too many films like this, I have to say. It's pretty unique, actually. Um, so, it's pretty But high. yeah, it's one, of those, it's one of these films that you just don't want to give away scenes, right? You just don't want to say anything. You just kind of got to go into it and check it out for yourself. But um yeah definitely check out rabies man especially if you've watched big bad wolves i mean i actually haven't even fucking seen the film yet but i've heard a lot of good things about it. but apparently this movie is completely different it's just completely different than big bad wolves i did it's so different but pick up a copy of that film on saturday so it's oh, coming nice nice cool so yeah rabies definitely definitely check it out it's fucking awesome Okay, my pick of the week this week is a film that if you guys are familiar with things that I've said about this film in the past, you might question this pick of the week. So it is Deadly Blessing from the year 1981. This is a Wes Craven film, Wesley Craven, the homie. Uh, <laughs> so so before I watched this film once before, and I didn't really care for it that much. And this is kind of a pick of the week that I'm recommending you guys go back and check this one out again if you didn't uh, like it the first time. Because on rewatch, I found it to be much more entertaining, I guess. Maybe it's because I saw the ending coming uh, a little bit differently. Uh, the film follows a Amish kind of cult called the Hittites. And it's a big farm and there's all these different families that, that are in this uh, area on this land and there is a woman whose husband was a former member of this uh, religious organization and he is mysteriously killed the wife's sisters come into town to kind of comfort her and meanwhile there's a bunch of stuff going on uh, some of the Hittites are having doubts about the family uh, then you have uh, these killings happening, and you're not really sure who's doing it. It's kind of a whodunit. The ending is, is so weird and bizarre. It, it's like, I, I guess I don't want to spoil anything. But I, I'm saying give this one another chance because I liked it a lot more this time watching it. I felt like the lead uh, religious guy, the, the the leader of the cult, um his performance is really good. He's he's this angry, kind of scary dude. Um, and he looks the part. He really just looks straight out of, like, Amish country. Uh, there's some interesting scenes that uh, are very kind of similar to Elm Street, but this film came out before Elm Street. And I know mm -hmm. Wesley Craven does this sometimes where he'll have, yeah. you know, almost direct scenes lifted from, from one film to another. I swear he's made Freddy Krueger the killer like four times in different films. <laughs> so uh, different incarnations of Freddy Krueger. You know, I think of um, my soul to take with that killer, and uh, there was uh, the the uh, shocker that that guy's kind of Freddy like. Um, but there's a scene where the woman's in a bathtub, and it's it's like the same exact shot as Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, yeah. Nancy's in the tub. Um, so, so there's that stuff in there. Uh, I, I feel like even like the dream, uh, type stuff is, it, it's, it's kind of, uh, a little bit, maybe he was having the ideas of Elm Street when he was making this film already, because it, it, there's definitely a lot of like dream sequences and the, in like dreamy type stuff, uh, spiders and snakes. It, I mean, it, it's a pretty long movie, um, it, it feels like it drags a bit at times, but I, I will recommend double checking this one out. Moods, you was gonna say something. 
I think that's actually one of the biggest problems with that film. Is it drags? Yeah, it, it drags way too much in, in parts and get, stuff. Um, we should get uh, Steve and Clive in here and do our uh, our Wes Craven <laughs> show that we've been meaning to do. That would be baller to get them in here one day to actually do that show. Yeah. You know, you know what's funny? Actually, I was even, I was even thinking about that too because I, I must have watched Deadly Blessing like four times in that one week, <laughs> and you didn't. And well, like, that's a, that's a challenge right there. I couldn't do that. Well, it what it, the thing is that like I'd seen you know obviously seen the film a couple times and and then it, that film turned into one of those films where I I used to really like it and then I I, I think I just kind of got sick of it <laughs> to be honest. So I don't know, but I, I there is parts in that film that do drag a little bit. But I know what you're saying about the the scene in the bathtub. Holy crap, man! Yeah, that is literally the exact same from scene, this film. scene from Nightmare. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So overall, but yeah, th- I've always said that Deadly Blessing has one of the weirdest endings ever. It so is it's such a weird film. It is a weird ending, and it, it's like a there's two yeah. weird moments in that ending. <laughs> Um, so yeah, overall, you know, I give it a seven out of ten. I once rated this film a six or a six point five, so I have came up from my previous rating, uh, and you know, I give it a seven. I think it's worth the the rewatch if you guys maybe weren't sure about it the first time. Give it another chance. I enjoyed it much more the second watch. Yep. All right. So my ahead, pick of the week is a movie that I watched in my women in horror class last Thursday for the first time and it blew my fucking mind and it is Brian De Palma's 1973 film The Sisters which is freaking amazing it reminded me of the Man in Two a little bit moods but nice um, the film basically I love the way the film uh, starts off it always makes me laugh considering the movie is pretty much all about the male gaze and the way that females gaze and men, things like that, especially towards the end. But the way the film starts is um, there's this like this game show that they make out of people, and it's called Peeping Tom. And they have this girl uh, in, a, in a dressing room changing, and like uh, the contestants on the show uh, place bets if the guy's going to actually look at her or walk away. And it's just fucking hilarious. It has a lot of a lot of uh, conversations about women's role in, in horror films right off the beginning. So then we cut forward and we learn that uh, the girl and the guy who are on this on this game show uh, they hook up, and we see that something's not right in this girl's apartment. That she has a sister, supposedly has a sister, that is uh, a little bit strange compared to her. And uh, after a few murders, we meet this journalist who's trying to so- or trying to find out um, if this woman really murdered this guy and things like that. And um, when the film comes to a conclusion, we learn, uh, you know, the 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 side of her story about who her sister is and things like that. And um, it's just a really really trippy sequence. The last mm, I don't know. 20 minutes of the so of the film is this extremely extremely weird and interesting and it's it has a lot of interesting conventions that the palmer plays on with the uh with with the women in the horror genre so um it's really 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 a solid film um criterion released it uh when it first got released i think it's out of print um and i know mood said arrow tommy arrow released it so I'm going to try and pick that up soon because the film is really, really good. It's really interesting for 1973. Um, you know, people often compare it that it's, you know, De Palma has a, has a history of, you know, ripping off Psycho just a little bit. Um, <laughs> you know, Dress to Kill is pretty much Psycho. And uh, this film has a little aspect of Psycho towards the end of the film. Um but that doesn't really take away from much of the film, you know. Copying is the most sincere form of flattery. So um, this is a really, really interesting film, really interesting character character aspect, and a really interesting film concerning the female gaze in the horror genre. So definitely check it out. It is awesome. I gave it a nine out of ten. 
All right, so uh, my pick of the week here is a film that came out originally in 2013, uh, released by Synapse Films in 2014, I believe on DVD only, and it's a film called Worm. Worm. You guys heard of this film? Worm. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's called not, Worm. But I like the title. <laughs> okay. Is it so about this a worm? Is a very, <laughs> this is a very interesting type film. Um, so basically, this movie kind of takes place in the future a little bit. But in the future, people no longer have the ability to dream. So this company has created this, uh, it's kind of like this genetically engineered worm type parasite type deal thing Ugh. called fantasites. <laughs> and it's, it's marketed as, it's called fantasites. So basically what people do in the future to, uh, you know, uh, to have dreams is what they do is they order these fantasites and they put these things into their ear. And then they have these crazy fucking dreams. They live out their dreams that they haven't been able to have in such a long time and stuff like that. So this movie right here follows a character named Charles. He is a, uh, he's a very awkward, um, maintenance guy. His dad run, he's like a landlord of this apartment building and whatnot. And, uh, Charles is, you know, kind of his lackey, kind of does all the shit work for him and stuff. Anyways, he's a very awkward character and he's kind of obsessed with his neighbor. Um, his neighbor is like this real cool guy and he's got this cool girlfriend and stuff. And, and what, and what's going on is, um, his neighbor can afford these, uh, these fantasites. So, um, the thing is in the future, you get these things delivered right to your door. So every day Charles would like intercept this order and he would kind of like take out one of the worms and he would try it out himself and whatnot. And, you know, and you know, his neighbors were getting them too. And so everyone in society is basically doing these, these fantasites and whatnot. And of course, you know, they start doing some real studies on these things and they, they turn out to be not very good for people. They originally thought w that when you put these worms into your ear, that they would just dissolve and it wasn't really ca causing any like bodily harm and stuff like that and whatnot. But they, they soon find out that it's actually causing sounds like antiviral man <laughs> i was okay. thinking the so, same thing okay so so anyways they, they figure out that these things are actually causing bodily harm and that they're actually highly addictive so society basically bans these fucking things so you know what happens when everyone's addicted to something and they get banned and stuff so it, it just basically turns into like a fight for these these uh, uh fantasites and stuff there's underground drug dealers dealing worms and shit like that and and shit like that and then it just kind of escalates from there now my thoughts on this film now if you put antiviral and requiem for a dream together you get worm it's such a weird kind That's of exactly yeah man this fucking movie man was really really interesting really well shot i think the the director did a really good job the performances are awesome one of the other unique things about this film is that this movie was done without a script um, I mean, wow. without dialogue written, without dialogue written. So to add to Charles awkwardness is like delivering his lines are just basically come off, coming off his head. It's really well done and it fucking works perfect. So Some of the lines, the way people like are acting. Yeah. And it's really interesting. It's really well done. Uh, the whole concept of the worms in the ear and shit is just intriguing itself. Um, and then it gets, it gets real nasty too, cause they're addicted to the shit and then they gotta find some more of these fantasites and then they really go to extreme levels to find some fantasites. Um, you know, Sounds and shit like that. Awesome. <laughs> it, it's it, it really, honestly really, does. it's a really intriguing film. Yeah. It's really fucking cool. Um, you know, I don't really want to give too much else away from it, but it has this kind of like, you know, futuristic, surreal type feel to it too, which is quite interesting. Um, and like I said, performances are awesome. It's really well shot. Uh, just a really unique premise that I think, I think a lot of people enjoy. Like I said, antiviral kind of mixed with, um, you know, Requiem. Requiem for a Dream. And it, you know, if, if you kind of think about that for a second, that's pretty much exactly what you get. You know, the downfall of the junkies and stuff. And, but, uh, very, very fascinating film, I have to say. Um, if I had to rate this one, I am also going to give this one a nine out of 10. Like, it's just such a breath of fresh air to see a film like this come out because it's just, kind of it's weird and different um you can't ignore this one definitely check it out so uh, like i said released by snaps i think this one's actually not that expensive like, you can get it for 17 yeah i think i got mine for 14 or something like that but yeah whatever it's you know snaps so it's really well done it's got some pretty cool features on it too actually it's even got the original short film called worm and it's got like the same people in it, but they look different. <laughs> it's like really funny, actually. I watched it after the movie and stuff, but um, definitely check it out, man. It's really fucking unique. So, is, really cool. um, what year did you say that came out? 
it originally came out in 2013. It just got released on oh, okay, DVD okay. So like a, a, a month ago or something. Yeah, so. Yeah, this is so one 2014. That I'm definitely making high priority because even as he was explaining it, I was thinking of uh, Antiviral and Rick Wham for a Dream a bit. And I yeah. think that's like a yeah. perfect combination. I, I really – it's one of those concepts that I'm like, this seems like something that, that I should have thought of. You know, it, it's something, it's right in that weirdness that I like. Um, I'm a huge fan of Requiem for a Dream and, and I love the idea of like this worm thing that, you know, it kind of reminded me of the vision stains from the theater bizarre too, where they're, uh, taking the fluid from people's eyeballs to kind of trip on it. It's like a drug. Oh, yeah. I like that concept of, of like, of this new drug, this new age futuristic drug type thing. So that that's definitely a high priority for me. I'm definitely going to seek that one out. So we're going to get into, uh, that was everyone's picks, yes. right? Yep. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we're going to get into some quick cuts here. Quick moods cuts. Is what <laughs> yeah. Th- this quick. segment should definitely be like moods personal segment because me and Jeremy are like slackers when it comes to watching stuff. So Jeremy, you actually don't have anything this week. Nope. I have one. Okay. You have one, so G- JP, you can go. All right. I've seen The Haunting from 1963. Ooh, good uh, choice. This is a ghost film, uh, a haunted house film, of course, directed by uh, Robert Wise. A scientist does some research into uh, a paranormal house called Hill House. Uh, a couple of uh, you know people follow him through. I found that this one was actually really impressive for the time. I love that film. I felt like that yeah, the sh- like the, I don't – I'm not – super super uh well all knowing on like cinematography and stuff but i felt like this one had a lot of really cool shots for the time and i'm not sure when you know these type of shots started popping up in films but i don't even want to talk about shots i watch er- uh, sergey eisenstein's the strike this weekend and i seriously wanted to shoot myself because it's literally like 4500 shots in the entire movie if he yes. wants to shoot he wants to shoot himself while watching shots. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, no, uh, so yeah, I, I mean, I thought that there was some really cool stuff in there with the cinematography. Um, a few times in this film, it, it's definitely a slow burn. Obviously it's 1963. There's not going to be a bunch of crazy stuff happening, but it, it, it builds tension. And I felt like there's a, there's one scene in particular where there's a, like this banging. It actually got my you know heart going a little bit. It, it, if you can invest yourself into this film and really, you know, put yourself in the time and place and, and, and just get lost uh, in, in the film, I think that it's, it's a pretty effective haunted house film and, and it's pretty, pretty scary. You know what I mean? Like scare is a, is a weird word we throw around because like who really gets scared anymore. But you know, uh, there's a few times when my heart gets going a bit and, and I, I really like that in this film. I, I give it a seven out of uh 10. You gave that movie a seven out of 10. Wow. Yeah. I mean, low, it's man. a little bit of a low rating. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, that's actually one of my favorite ghost films of all time. Yeah, that and uh, The Old Dark House is really good. Check out The Old Dark House. It's a universal film. It's, mm-hmm. it's amazing. It's really good, too. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, probably could have came in a little bit higher, but I'm, I'm sticking with the 7 out of 10 just because of, um, you know, it, it's a bit slow. Yeah. Cool. All right, so <laughs> uh, my quick cuts here. Probably not going to be so quick, is it? Because then you watch 87 movies this week. <laughs> yeah, I had a busy week, man. I, I spent a lot of time watching films. So, Anyways, the first film I watched is called uh, Random Acts of Violence. This is from 2011. Um, I thought the premise sounded really interesting for the film. It's about this guy. He's like a he's like a British dude. He's living in New York. He's been living there for like a long time and whatnot. Um, he's really fed up with the way New York is now. He feels that everything is just kind of stupid and shitty and people suck. And he wants to really kind of do something about it. He's just really annoyed with the city and the way things are going about and whatnot. So basically what he does is he he wants to go on a crime spree to kind of generate some buzz and, you know, kind of start a revolution and stuff to change the whole city and shit like that. But it's kind of shot like documentary style. You know, it's it's he's got a film crew following him and he's basically just going around like randomly killing people. There's no motive to why he's killing specific people, but he's just really trying to create a buzz. Um, you know, the prim- the premise sounds a lot, you know, funnier than it actually is. I was really, really annoyed with this movie, though. Like some of the comedy and shit, I was just like, ugh, it was just fucking dragging. It was pissing me off and stuff. Um, I really did not enjoy this at all. 
like by the I just couldn't wait for the fucking thing to end. And I think the end was actually the best part of the fucking movie. The credits. Um, no, not the credits. The actual like end <laughs> scene was actually probably the best scene in the film, um, which is so sad. But, you know, it does have an intriguing premise and there's some pretty funny lines. I did laugh. But overall, it was just really bland and it's been done before. And I don't know, man. It was just it was just kind of irritating. Um, I give it about a three out of ten. There was really no mm. redeemable qualities for me. It's just it really kind of pissed me off. Um, next up, I watched The Last Days on Mars uh, from 2014. Ooh, I just bought this. This is, um, you know, a film obviously based on Mars about this uh, group of uh, scientists and whatnot. They're in, on Mars and the, the day before they're supposed to go home, one of the, one of the people, one of the guys finds like potential life, uh, alien life and stuff like that. So they kind of stick around, um, and it doesn't really work out too well for them. All of a sudden people start getting fucked up by this alien force and shit like that. And, um, it's actually really fun. I thought it was really good. Lee Shriver's in the film it does a really good job. Uh, it's shot really well. Good performances. Uh, I thought the effects were actually quite well done in this too. Um, so that getting back to Jeremy not liking, you know, space films and stuff. This is one definitely to check out. Well, I just bought it like, yeah. Well, like 10 days ago. It's, it's actually really, it's really fun. I was, you know, very impressed throughout the whole film. Uh, I give it about a seven and a half out of 10. Uh, next up, I watched the new Godzilla film from, of course, <laughs> 2014. You? Um, fucking sucks. Jesus, man. Really? Oh, this it's movie. Terrible, dude. Okay, visually is absolutely outstanding. It yeah. looks really fucking good. Like they did a really good job with the monsters. The whole tone of the film is actually, or I mean, the, not the tone, but the whole look of the film is really well done. It's really dark though. Um, but uh, the story, the stories, you know, everything that's going on in the film is really fucking boring. <laughs> really, isn't that really with every boring. Godzilla film though? No, this yeah, one this, is really. This one is just really generically boring, and like, just you don't care about anything, and like. Ugh, it's just, it's a bore fest. I like, do give this one, like, basically a pass because it is, you know, visually kind of really well done. Like, there's a sequence that takes place. This is place. like Transformers. Yeah, there's a sequence that takes place on this train. I l- or uh, uh, on, like, this L train with this little Asian boy. I literally <laughs> wanted to shoot myself when I was watching the sequence because I knew exactly what was going to happen at the oh, end. Fu- it's like, fucking oh, shoot. Fu- and fucking oh yeah totally but uh you know like i said visually i mean if you just want to like leave your brain at the door and just fuck i don't know man like i said i'll give this one about a five out of ten just mm, visually wow. really really good but it's fucking boring man I, yeah, there wasn't there wasn't sad, enough godzilla. one of the biggest complaints a lot of people are having that it was too dark not enough godzilla and it, it's it's a very honest you know critique on on valid. the film you know it's very valid because there really isn't a lot of Godzilla, man. It's too bad, but because he fucking looks good, though. Yeah, Godzilla yeah. does look good. He looks good, and, yeah. and that's kind of that's kind of the downfall to it. You're like, fuck, I really want to see Godzilla a little more. It just doesn't happen. Uh, next up, I watched a film from 2014 called Crawl or Die. Uh, I seen this one at Walmart. Wow, um, this was this was an <laughs> this was an interesting film. It's kind of like kind of post apocalyptic a little bit. There's Basically, every female in the earth has uh, been deemed that they cannot uh, conceive ch- children except for this. They found one girl that can. What the fuck is this? Children of men? Like, what the <laughs> fuck? But, that sounds like children of men. So this this elite group, this task force, whatever, has to go and find this girl. She's like hidden in these fucking like this underground tunnels and bunkers and stuff. She's hiding out. So anyways, they, uh, they have to go and get her. Um, this movie is fucking crazy, man. Like... I think it was like shot for seven thousand dollars or whatever. This movie is amazing. For Are you 7, serious? $7. This movie is so fucking. It's re- it's shot amazing. Oh my god! I it's passed this am- one up because the cover looked like sh- ass. Oh yeah, it's shot amazing. What they do in these scenes is fucking crazy. It is. It has to be the most claustrophobic film I've ever seen in my life. This girl trying to save this other girl. She's like the. the her name is oh, fuck. What the hell's her name? I can't remember. But she's crawling through these real t- these tunnels, and they keep getting smaller and smaller. And it's so claustrophobic. And there's this fucking like monster, basically, you know, f- trying to get at them and stuff. It's just really crazy. But for seven thousand dollars, outstanding. Outstanding! I highly recommend this film. It was really a fun watch. It was really Damn, crazy. I guess I'm gonna go buy this tomorrow, the next day as well, I dude. Think, I, I think you guys will really enjoy it. I think the ending probably could use a little tweaking, but everything leading up to that is just—it really makes you feel uncomfortable I I watching this film. It's crazy. If you are claustrophobic and you're watching this film, this would probably be the most uncomfortable film you could possibly ever watch, man. It's pretty crazy. That's crazy, um, dude. 
but I have to give it up to the the lead actress that that did this role. Fuck, man, she's a soldier, man, because you can tell that she was going through some hell. This is pretty so wild. Great. I've heard Pretty nothing fun. about this film. I've seen it at yeah. Walmart for weeks, weeks, yeah. and I never even thought about picking it up. That's I crazy. Actually, I actually heard um, Horsball talking about this film briefly, and he recommended it, and I just I completely had forgot about it. And I actually saw it at Walmart and picked it up. I was like, oh, that's the movie he was talking about. And I decided to give it a shot because it was like 10 bucks or whatever. And, uh, yeah, worked out. 7.5 out of 10. Definitely check it out. Really, wow. really good stuff. Um Next up, I watched another film called uh, from 2014 called Daddy's Little Girl. Um, this one is released by Vicious Circle Films. Uh, this is about a, um, a single dad. He's divorced from his wife and whatnot. He has this little girl, um, and he just you know adores her to death. But the thing is, he's separated from his wife and whatnot. So the mom, I believe, has the kid throughout the week. Anyways, one day he drops his girl back off at uh, his his mom's house and whatnot. He was complaining that, um, you know, that the, the daughter's room has a broken window and it doesn't lock properly and whatnot. He was kind of giving her shit about that. Anyways, one night, uh, his daughter actually goes missing. Um, they find her the same day she's been raped and murdered on a beach. And basically he's like hell bent on finding out who the fuck did this and stuff. He does find out who does it and the torture starts. Wow. This movie, man. Holy fuck brutal very simple concept it's one of those you know vigilante justice basically yeah but it's the fact of who fucking did the rape and murder in this film um now do they play with the thing like maybe he's wrong no no (laughs) no and i have to say man that was a fast answer the torture in this fucking film is brutal brutal They really thought out some torture shit to do to this fucking <laughs> guy, man. Like genital it, mutilation. It, it takes place over six days. He basically says, "For every year of her life, I'm going to torture you to shit." For so it's just like seven bit. days, but like. But yeah, but like this is just this is really really good, really good, man. You really fucking feel for the dad, um, and just the the simple fact of who actually did the rape and murder. Um, Oh fuck, dude! It, it's really, really fantastic. Really good film. Good performances. But I man, heard there was some dark comedy in that one. Is that true? Because it doesn't sound very comedic to me. It's not. It's not comedic. <laughs> I could be thinking it's not. One. It's it's a good watch if you like these type of films. Uh, definitely give it a shot. It's I believe it's an Australian film. Um, most definitely an Australian film. Um, but yeah, really good performances. And uh, fuck me, man, that torture. Holy shit! It had me squirming, man. Definitely I'm not. It's getting... been on my radar. I was squirming like no tomorrow watching this film. Like I was having a hard time with it. I was like, holy fuck, kept looking away. And I was like, Jesus, man. Like, uh, anyways, nine out of 10. Fantastic. Wow, what's this movie called? Daddy's, Daddy's Little, Little Girl. Girl. Okay. Uh, next up, I watched a film oh. from 1971 called Don't Deliver Us from Evil. Uh, this is a classic film. It's a classic French film. Um, yeah, which I had actually never seen before. This is the first time I've ever seen this movie. Uh, finally got around to grabbing it. It's from Mondo Macabro. Uh, it's basically about these two girls. They go to this, um, you know, religious type school and whatnot. And they are really, they don't have any interest in that, you know, religious, religious bullshit and stuff. And they kind of pledge their, they've pledged their allegiance to Satan and stuff. And what they do, they, they basically just kind of go, they're like crazy little girls. They start fucking with some people just randomly. They start doing like crazy shit to them. Like, for instance, this one guy, they kind of, like, lead him on a little bit, and then they, they go and fuck up his birds, and they, they do all this, like, crazy-ass shit. They're just being random little fuckheads and stuff like that. But So they kind of they kind of start torturing people throughout this film, and it kind of escalates into, like, something really, really bad. They kind of go too far with one of their pranks. And, uh, yeah, so that doesn't work out too well for them. Um, but uh, the end of this film is just fucking crazy. What they do... You know, in the, in the final scene is just, it's really, really fucking nuts. But this is a study of like, these girls are in high school. I think they're like supposed to be about 16, 17 years old. And they're just, you just want to fucking strangle them the whole movie. They, you hate them so much because of what they're doing to like these innocent people. You know, they're fucking with them and oh God, really, really good film, really, really good performances and stuff. Eight out of 10. Check it out. Fantastic film. Next up is another film from 2014 called Blood Widow. Um, this is, which I 
assumed was just going to be like a very, very type, you know, generic type slasher film, especially with the cover. Actually, the cover is kind of cool. I, I like the mask and stuff like that. Um, it's about this couple that's, you know, they go out to this, uh, this place out in the country and whatnot. They just bought this new place, and whatnot, and they're going to have a party. Anyways, the, their proper, their new property is like right next to this abandoned school. Um, and at the school, I think it was like, 15 years earlier 20 years earlier something like that there was some type of massacre that happened at the school which eventually shut down the school and, and it got abandoned and whatnot but anyways there was one sole survivor that actually never left the school <laughs> right so this you know this slasher this killer has been living in the basement of the school and whatnot anyways the people are having this party some of the guests decide to, that they're going to go explore this uh this abandoned school and whatnot and of course they start getting picked off one by one now the film sounds quite generic, really. I mean, the, the storyline's nothing that we haven't seen before type deal, whatnot. Uh, what separates this one is there's some pretty damn good uh, kills in this one. The body count's pretty high, but the ending fucking rules. <laughs> like, the ending is fan-fucking-tastic. Uh, didn't hold anything back. You know, they didn't cop out. They did a really good job with the ending. Really enjoyed it. And I kind of like the, the look of the killer, too. Um, pretty interesting. I really enjoyed it, man. Like I said, some of the kills were pretty fucking awesome. And ending was just really, really worth it. Seven and a half out of ten. Definitely check it out. Really enjoyed it. Another film from 2014 I watched called Torment. This one's starring Catherine Isabel. Um, and it's another home invasion I film. I that movie so bad. This is another type home invasion film. Um, basically, yeah, they the the father um, and you know his biological son and whatnot. He's just remarried his original his first wife is died and he's remarried Catherine Isabel um and the, the son just fucking hates his stepmom just can't <laughs> stand his stepmom right so anyways they go off to the this is the first time that they've been at their vacation home with you know with the new mom and stuff like that so the kid's really hesitant he's kind of being a fucking little shithead and I stuff like that, that. Kid. and uh so so what they uh so soon after you know going to this vacation house they they realize that someone's been in their house um there's like rotten food everywhere and stuff like that and um and shit like that. And basically, you know, these people, they come back for them, uh, kidnap the kid, and they start basically torturing the fucking shit out of, you know, the family and, and doing crazy shit and stuff like that. Um, you know, it it has its up, ups and downs. I think the performances in this film are really good. Uh, overall, as a product, it's kind of generic a little bit. It doesn't really bring anything new to the home invasion type uh, subgenre. The cover. You know, and generic. that's the thing. And the problem is with this one is that it's very, very predictable on who's doing it. Uh, I figured it out right away. So I was a little disappointed by the end and I was like, fucking seriously. But, you know, for the, everyone out there that loves Catherine Isabel, definitely check it out. She does a good job. She looks sexy as hell. Um, but it doesn't bring anything really that new. I give it a six out of 10. It's decent. It has its really good moments. There's this one really crazy scene with the father and the son uh, that's really unsettling. Um, it's kind of fucking nasty what they do. Um, so it, it's probably even worth it just for that scene, but in Catherine Isabel. So six out of 10, a little bit of a pass. Next up is a film that we talked about last week that I said I was probably not going to check out. Of course I bit and I fucking hit and it's called hazmat. <laughs> <laughs> this fucking movie, man. So this one right here is about, it's basically about this, uh, this game show. It, what they do is they, they fucking pull like really vicious pranks on people. Anyway, so it follows this group of people. They've got this friend, and then he's he's really kind of fucked up. You know, he's he's had issues. His dad, his father passed away, whatever. But he's been like really weird since his dad died and shit like that. And they figure that if they if they scare the shit out of him, it'll look kind of you know scare him straight. Um, it doesn't really work like that. So they're working on this very elaborate uh, you know joke or prank in this um, this place where his dad used to work. It's like a it's like a has it's some kind of chemical plant or whatever anyways it totally goes completely backwards this guy fucking figures out that he's being you know punked and he goes fucking ape shit finds an axe and just starts fucking wheeling out everybody um it's super super generic and the the worst thing about this film is that the acting is so fucking bad in it like bloody homecoming bad oh it's so awful like I, at, there was that t- there was times where i I thought that they were kind of faking it because of the cameras and stuff like, you know, on the TV show, like inside the film. But this is actually what they were like, how they were acting. Oh, my God, man. It was just it was torture to watch, man. It was really bad. And all the kills were 
the exact same. He basically just, you know, takes out people with an axe and it's really not that exciting. Um, I don't recommend this one at all. It was pretty generic. Four out of ten. Not a lot of redeemable qualities from it. Uh, next up, I watched a film from 2012 called The Pact. Um, Jeremy, have you seen this one? I have not, but I know it's getting There's a, a sequel. sequel. Right. Yeah, um, totally. Uh, this one right here is about a girl. Um, she start the, the film starts out with this girl. She's in this house, and her mom has just passed away and whatnot. Anyway, she's on the phone talking to her sister, and she's like, well, you got to come here. we got to figure out these plans and arrangements for the mom's funeral and whatnot. Anyway, she kind of turns around and disappears. And uh, so the sister shows up at the house, and she can't find her sister. And she's like, what the fuck? Where is she? And apparently her sister had, like, drug problems and stuff like that. And she always did this type of thing. She always kind of disappeared and whatnot. Uh, then she soon realizes that that's probably not the case. She probably didn't, like, you know, just disappear because of drugs and whatnot. There's something else kind of going on and stuff. Um, this is one I can't really say a whole lot about. Uh, but there is, like, a really kind of dark and deep secret that's going on in the house and whatnot and stuff. I actually really enjoyed this film. It was really kind of... It was kind of dark, but I can see why people wouldn't like this film. But there, the shit that's going on inside the house and what it kind of comes to is, is kind of interesting. I kind of like the way it developed, but there are certain scenes that you kind of question a little bit, um, on how they didn't know about these certain things. Like I, like I said, I can't really say anything, but, um, I kind of thought like it was like a, you know, kind of a ghost type film for the most part. Um, kind of is and kind of isn't it, it's kind of different i guess but uh i don't know definitely check it out man it's an ifc release i really i really enjoyed it but uh yeah so th- i'm really 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 curious to see the sequel on this one so seven and a half out of ten definitely check it out it was really enjoyable uh next up i watched uh escape from tomorrow man. i believe this I, I believe this came out in 2013 okay, i want to listen to this because i escape have my from- own opinions on this movie um, yeah, this is another one that's kind of interesting too. It's, uh, basically about this family, this, this father who, um, ultimately just lost his job in the beginning of the film, decides to take his family on this, uh, um, magical, um, this Disney, ha- vaca- Disney vacation, I the guess, or whatever. This film is so fucking nasty. Oh yeah. my God. I was like gagging is so bad. Yeah. And, um, so anyways, he takes his family on this trip and then soon after, you know, being at Disneyland or Disney World or whatever, um, he starts having, he starts having like these really fucked up visions and shit. Like shit is just like turning all evil and he's having like these really weird visions and stuff. This is a really kind of hard one to review because yeah, of all the weird is. shit. But that's basically the premise. They get to this, you know, their vacation spot and they, the guy kind of starts wigging out and having like these weird visions and he starts doing weird things and. <laughs> It's really fucking weird, man. Girls were really... good looking, the two French chicks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like the fucking <laughs> the young ones. But yeah, I don't know. It's kind of one that you need to definitely check out for yourself to kind of, you know, voice your own opinion on. You would agree with that though, right? Yeah, I I was a I was a pretty big fan of this film when I watched it the first time. Then I watched it on the Blu ray when it came out. Um my opinions fell just a little bit on it. Um, it's an interesting, interesting film. Nothing like this have ever, has ever been done before in this kind of, you know, in this kind of aspect. It's an interesting film. Everybody should watch once. I think one of the coolest things about the film is that it's actually filmed in black and white. Yeah. And it adds like this total surreal type feel to it already with the, you know, the, all these horrific visions and shit that are happening. But I think the black and white element is perfect for it. Like I said, the ending is fucking nasty as hell. And, yeah, coming, and, and you wouldn't see it coming from a movie like this. It's very... Yeah, low the, gore and things like the, that. Yeah, the ending is really fucking bizarre, but I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a very interesting watch. It kept me kind of, I was intrigued through the whole film. I won't lie. So I give it about a seven and a half out of ten. What, what would you rate that one? Um, about that when I first watched it, it's dropped a little bit now, probably you know, six and a half or seven. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, I watched another film from 2014. This one's been getting a shit ton of buzz. Been recommended by a lot of people. It's called Pieces of Talent. Uh, it's a, uh, indie film. Um, this is a really unique fucking movie. Really, really unique film, man. I gotta say, uh, this one follows, uh, your main character, shit, man, her name totally escapes me right now. 
she works at a strip club. She's an aspiring actress and whatnot and stuff. And she really fucking hates her life, to be honest. Her mom lives with her. her mom's like a, an alcoholic. She's a total shithead, too. She does shitty things, always taking her car and stuff like that. So anyways, the girl, she's really trying to you know break it in, into Hollywood. She's been going to all these auditions and whatnot. Anyways, this one specific night at the club, um, she catches one of the bouncers beating the fucking shit out of this guy. Anyway, she pulls the bouncer off the this dude, kind of saves him and stuff. Um, takes off from work. She jumps in his. She throws him into the van because he's like, he's not passed out. The guy beat him like senseless. Anyway, she threw him into the van and she basically drives out to this lake or whatnot. He wakes up in the morning and he's like, "Who the fuck are you?" Kind of thing, right? Anyways, they get talking and shit like that, and they kind of come to the re- realization that they neither of them really have much friends and stuff. So this kind of makes a little more sense on why she did this. And, uh, but anyways, they start get, they start talking and whatnot. And he says that he's like an aspiring or he's not, he's an aspiring. He's actually a director. And she's like, Oh, really? Well, I'm an aspiring actress and whatnot and shit like that. But meanwhile, you, you do know things about this guy. He's actually been making his own videos. He's been kind of kidnapping people, setting up cameras and sets and stuff like that and kind of almost making snuff films, really. He's murdering people and shit like that it, but his character man is fucking he's such a weirdo in this film oh, oh, pulls it off oh, just oh, fucking perfect fucking boring um so but movies like this dude this movie is fucking phenomenal really? this has the weirdest structure to it ever it sounds so like g- generic it's no, interesting it's it's totally not man the way the structure of this film is like it's just so odd it's very oddly paced and like really really well done the gore <laughs> fuck man there's a couple scenes in this with some amazing gore really good shit but really good performances one of the coolest things about this film is the performances by the lead actress and uh the killer oh man they do amazing jobs like for an indie film the acting is brilliant really really well done um oh fuck dude this guy's just psychotic as shit too but one of the most well actually i won't even say that but anyways Definitely check this out. It's been getting a shit ton of buzz. I know everybody's been recommending this film. I really enjoyed it. It's fucking end is just so bizarre. Uh, eight out of ten. Next up, I watched a uh, <laughs> film called Creature from the. What do you have? This will be the last one. Uh, next up is a film called uh, Creature from the Hillbilly Lagoon. This is directed <laughs> by um, Richard Griffin. Uh, Richard Griffin's one of my favorite indie directors. He does a lot of different type of film slashers. Very. You know, he can do some serious tone films, but then he can do some really kind of like oddball films. This is obviously a take on the creature from the Black Lagoon type story. It's about a bunch of students that uh, basically um, they go out to this uh, to this area where some toxic sludge has been fucking uh, dumped toxic into this lake and whatnot. Sludge. Toxic waste or whatever. But anyways, they're doing like tests on this shit like that and stuff like that and, and whatnot. And what the stuff has actually done is created, you know, this <laughs> this basically lagoon type monster and whatnot anyways they start getting picked off one by one it's like a silly creature feature type film but it's fucking enjoyable really funny practical effects and uh just want to it's kind of goofy but it's actually not overly goofy where you're just like this is like silly stupid um which actually quite surprised me because i thought it was going to be a lot more stupid than it actually was um the acting in the film was kind of hit miss at times but uh you know, the creature definitely made up for it. It was pretty funny. So I, I give it a solid 7 out of 10. All right, guys. That's going to do it for uh, Quick Cuts. Um, sorry so about quick that. Cuts. That, was, that was not so Quick Cuts. I just watched a lot of fucking films this week. Sorry about that. Um, anyways, guys, we're going to get into the main review this week. And that is um, uh, a release by Screen Factory. I believe this came out in the summertime sometime. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it is a chiller film. And it's called Monkey's Paw. What is that? It's a monkey's paw. My daddy said it could take hold of a man's life. Move the pieces around. Three bones, three good wishes. It's yours now. You ready to go? I'm ready to go. What? The awful truth is... Bad things happen all the time. You see, Carl? I'm sure he's fine. I wish you weren't dead. I told you, I don't know what's going on. (laughs) Am I still dead? Hello? You have willingly entered into the combination of that what is dark. Now you sit responsible for the man with no soul. You make him 
so he makes you. I want that third wheel. Your buddy from work gets chunked in the brain, and now he's threatening people you know. It takes what you want, and it ruins it, just like it ruined you. Oh my god! I'm gonna find it. <laughs> what you want it's my turn now i believe this is from 2013 yeah it debuted on chiller in 2013 the monkey's paw but released by scream factory in 2014 yeah yeah so jp want to get into the plot yes so our main character is jake who is unhappy in life his girlfriend who he is no longer with his ex-girlfriend is married to his boss he doesn't really like what he does for a living he doesn't even own a car he then gets one of his co-workers fired he feels bad the co-worker then gives jake a monkey's paw the classic tale of the monkey's paw it gives you three wishes but unfortunately those wishes are the be careful what you wish for kind of wishes where they uh, go bad and essentially it is not really about the monkey's paw it follows his uh, friend who he accidentally kills and then wishes to come back to life kind of pet cemetery-esque and he must stop his friend Cobb uh, before uh, Cobb kills everybody that he loves that's essentially what it is (laughs) (laughs) okay Uh. so uh, this one to me um, I feel like it was a big missed opportunity with the classic tale of the monkey's paw, man. I mean, that's what uh, I was looking forward to seeing. But me too, man. It, it, it is straight up. It seems like these killer cemetery. films. These killer films are more bad than they are good. To be completely honest, I, I don't think know. I love Beneath. Okay, Beneath is okay. Uh, Chilling Visions is fucking awesome. But now we have two duds. We've had two duds in a row. Mm-hmm. What was the other sure, dud? Uh, Dead Shadows. Dark. Uh, Dead Shadows. No, that wasn't was, chiller. It's not a chiller film. Oh, all right. No, okay. Okay. I think a lot of people thought it was a chiller film just yeah. because it was like one of those Shitty. new titles, but it's just some French film. Like, oh, out, Dead but... Souls wasn't that the other chiller film? Oh yeah, Dead Souls. Yeah, was Dead actually... Souls. Oh, yeah. that one's pretty shitty too. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, there is, there is, in my opinion, there is some good things about this film. Um, Definitely. I liked. Uh, I really did like the you know the small town feel to the film mm-hmm. it actually does actually the setting is really good mm-hmm. you know it actually legitimately feels like that small town and it's it's really shown in the beginning of the film after um absolutely after after buddy gets fired they go to the bar and then you see you know everyone's kind of there and stuff like that it just gives that perfect small town feeling like that's just where everybody goes and you know? also the actual work environment because one mm-hmm. of the first scenes is in in the job place and it kind of reminds you of like my bloody valentine the original like that work environment not as good but it, it has that feel to it i definitely appreciate that feel and when it first started i was like all right this is gonna be good throwing the monkey's paw three wishes be careful what you wish for thing i'm, I'm liking where this is going um mm-hmm. but to me as soon as they move as soon as his second wish is granted uh first of all the first wish was stupid the second wish uh, once it's granted it really does just it's a it's a it's a remake of pet cemetery in a way it's just using that idea of like the undead come back but they're not they're soulless now and i hated that oh i literally i literally said the same thing when i first watched this i was like this is just pet cemetery Mm -hmm. you know but okay okay honestly the thing that bugs me about this film is the fact of how jake gets that monkey's paw that whole scene like buddy's sitting out there he just got fucking fired from his job and he's got this monkey paw but the thing that bugs me is that he knows when he gives it to this guy, he's going to use it. He's going to have wishes, wishes and stuff. I understand why he gives it to him because he knows it's, he, there's going to be like some serious consequences to it. But, you know, later on in the film, he really is like disgusted with himself. Yeah. You know, on what he did. Like he gave it to this kid and he fucked up. He made some wishes and there was some serious consequences to it. But then you see this guy and he's just like completely bent out of shape and he's fucking drinking. He's just lost his mind Mm -hmm. and he's like so out of it. I'm like, dude, you knew this was fucking coming. But let me touch on that real quick. I totally understand what you're saying. And there is a way to do that right. You know, and I, I just thought of it and I didn't want to forget about it. 
Lance Hendrickson and Pumpkinhead. There's a way to do it right, and that's how it's done right, where he, he knows what he's doing, but once he actually sees it happen, it destroys him. This is how you do it wrong. Yeah, exactly. I totally agree. And I don't know, man. It just – I really wish they had to came up with a different way of Jake getting that monkey spawn well, stuff. Is simp- I mean, I understand what they did. You know, Buddy kind of wanted to get back at him a little bit. Um, but seriously, like he just – did Buddy have the fucking monkey's paw on him? <laughs> like, did like after work did he go home and grab this thing just specifically to give to Jake because he knew he was gonna fuck him over? He probably or... carried it on a keychain like a rabbit's foot. But that 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 thing is like pretty fucking know, big though. Like it's, it's actually it's like this, it's like the size of like a galaxy, man. It's fucking huge. Okay, so here's how you fix that, right? <laughs> At the beginning of the film, how did the how did the guy get the monkey's paw? Just trade characters. Jake gets the monkey paw that way, and he kept it locked away for all these years. And you know, for some yeah. reason, he had to pick it out. That that's how you hmm. deal yeah, with you know, that I, issue. That's interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. I, I never, never thought, thought about of, that. I never thought of it that way. I was kind of thinking of other ways, but yeah, that's actually <laughs> you know a simple solution. Totally. Yeah, but the thing was, I actually thought that's what they was doing. That's why I thought of that idea. And then mm. when they didn't do it that way, I was like, okay, well, I can see why you wouldn't do it that way because it's so like cliche almost but you made it worse by doing it the other way because the character is conflicted emotions like that's not how he would react and it was just done poorly the way that the monkey's paw happens and the way that the character then changes his mind about like how he gave it to you know his feelings towards giving it to him and stuff a lot of problems very problematic film in terms mm. of just the script, you know, definitely could have used some more rewrites. And I wish I, I don't know, but did you like the uh, Cobb character when he was pre soulless? I liked him a lot, dude. He was like too f- cool for school, you know, just this like old yeah, wise somebody that dude. you would be friends with. Probably. Yeah, I mean, I I like <laughs> Cobb too, actually, because he was just kind of he was the real deal, you know. Like he openly admitted that, you know, like he kind of fucked up and shit like that, and. Mm-hmm. You know, he was just he was just being honest. He's you know, and he was basically dude telling Jake work, he's like it has a lot of life experience that you listen I do, to. I do like the dialogue. It's it's kind of cliched and it's a little little generic, but it does work for the for what it was. You know, when he's talking telling Jake about, you know, everyone gets car- or dealt cards. It's just on how you play them. Mm-hmm. And I, I did like that because it did really kind of work for what it was for him and stuff but you know he he was sincere he was he was a good character and stuff um when he obviously turns evil holy fuck man <laughs> he was fucking badass though yeah man. yeah he was fucking super badass i, I thought like, he was good casting though it, that, that was yeah that was probably the best thing about the movie was the casting of uh oh what's his name uh, no not his characters and stephen lang mm. Uh, the guy that played Cobb. Fuck, he was good in that, man. Really I good. think all the casting was pretty good. Even the catfish dude, the the, the friend, I liked him. Um, I disagree, actually. I thought I couldn't stand Jake. I think he's a terrible yeah, leader. Yeah, he's, the, he's the, the exception. Yeah, the I, I just like that film. He's just not – oh, my God, dude. I, but I think what he was working with also didn't lend him any favors either because I, I thought that the, the character um, was – like the whole you know i hate my life thing you know it's it's not i want it it's not as fulfilling as i wish it would be like Mm -hmm. that should be easy enough to work (laughs) with it it is kind of cliche too but i don't know man yeah you're right you're right he's i think the whole i think the whole the whole subplot you know with jake and fucking you know his boss being married to like his ex-girlfriend and stuff was so fucking lame yes it was so lame it I was hated, lame man. i hated the scene i hated the scene so much when jake and cobb show up at his uh at her house right and he's just kind of talking to her and stuff and then but cobb she looks cool as hell <laughs> yeah but like what what jake says is so ridiculous she goes inside the house and he goes oh she's so damn pretty i'm like really dude Oh, fucking lame. Super fucking lame. I hated that whole sub story. Oh, sucked. Yeah. W- it's wasted just not the enjoy- monkey's paw story. Because I love this story, man. I love the be careful what you wish for thing. And you always expect like some twists and stuff, man. And they mm-hmm. just they just used it as, as a, a plot device and made the story about something else. It was just that it was a plot device to have a pet cemetery story. And it was so annoying and frustrating to watch that mm-hmm. they did that. Yeah, I totally agree. And it was Jeremy? really annoyed. Oh wait, sorry. Uh, I'm, I, lis- I'm listening. Don't worry. I'm just I got. 
I was really actually annoyed the scene where uh, where Jake um, smashes the car up and uh, Cobb goes through the windshield. Seriously, we all know windshields don't break like that. Come on. <laughs> yeah, but don't you tell me like rocks hit your windshield all the time and they just like get demolished? Not like windshields don't break like that. It's a, <laughs> that's just everyone knows that though. It's like holy shit, that, that thing broke like fucking studio glass, man. <laughs> it's a movie. Yeah, totally. But what you know do what you I'm think, saying? Jeremy? Um, I, I could see where you're getting at. Um, but do you can you think of any other movies like this with the monkey's paw? JP, I mean. Not like specific like movies that that is is the monkey's paw, but there's like the monkey paw, but like the genie in a bottle or whatever, you know. That kind of thing. It was really done a lot in like anthology shows, but I'm sure there are movies that I'm just not thinking of right now. I know for a fact I've seen I've seen tons of movies that that do the "be careful what you wish for" thing. I just Mm -hmm. can't think of any offhand. Can you moods? Um, no, I was trying to think of that. I actually can't. But you know, you've (laughs) seen a movie called Brass Teapot. It's put out by Magnet, if I stand corrected. Um, it's all right. It, it has one of those type of wish, you know, do what you wish for type of a thing. But that that was one that popped in my mind. Leprechaun but, too. Yeah, Leprechaun. <laughs> Morty. Back to Leprechaun. Morty kind of reminds me a little bit of Cobb. <laughs> you know, another thing about this movie that was kind of fucking weird is that I thought it was actually really slow paced. You know, like the middle part of the film. It was. It, it starts really? off good, though, does it not? It's like it's good pacing at the beginning. I, I say all the way up until the uh, the window break that he was talking about, the, the yeah. car crash, that straight downhill from there. Mm-hmm. And yeah. even the bar setting, that was a good setting, right? I mean, like the mm-hmm. even like some of the lighting um, with uh, the, the the I don't where is it set in like Alabama or something or Mississippi. I I wanted to say it was set it was set New Orleans, but or not like I mean like way south like that. So yeah, maybe I'll bet. I don't know. It's definitely in the south somewhere. Yeah, I lo- I like the setting. I thought I thought it uh, it had like a good. Uh, I thought maybe I missed that, but I don't think they actually do say. But yeah, it's quite like obviously that. in the south. I mean, there's I mean the reason for the accident is because they swerved from this a, a gator, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't really know what to say about the film. I just, it's really, really disappointing. I love the premise of the film, you know, like the whole, like we just discussed, but, uh, it's just executed so poorly. <laughs> Sucks. I, I thought, I, I thought some of the kills were actually not so bad. The one mm-hmm. scene where he, you know, where he puts the machete through the dude's head, uh, was actually quite surprising. Like I wasn't expecting to see that type of, um, you know, practical effect and, you know, when, where was this movie made? I know we asked that in the beginning. It was. It came out in 2013 on Chiller. Yeah. All right. So I assume it's the United States of America. Film. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, but it. I, I think that also the monkey's paw itself. The backstory to it was kind of lame. I, I I wanted them to go a little bit more into like the, maybe like the actual legend of the monkey's paw and, and, and things like that and and make a little bit more creative of how how it came well, about they don't really put that much backstory to it anyways it's basically just the father perishing and handing it off to the son and being like be careful there was a this. bit of backstory <laughs> the um the, fa- did you the, the, the son months? the son's uh brother went off to war or something and and the father was like pissed and let yeah. uh people stay at the house and some dude like brought it in like i i I thought that was intriguing. I almost wish they would have like went into that a little bit more. It, they needed something. Like, I mean, you that's the thing. That's the thing. Something. Yeah, they totally don't go into really anything, so it's kind of forgettable. I mean, you really only even remember the scene where the father's handing it off and as he's perishing. Yeah, you know, but it's like it's so forgettable. And Such the a shame. ending, I thought was crap. For the the, it almost betrays like the the character with uh Cobb what the the ending for Cobb I was mm. I, I didn't understand like what the hell CJP it sounds like you're hating this movie as much as you hated Torture Chamber I didn't hate Torture Chamber I just mm, it sure I sounded just, like you hated it when you <laughs> <laughs> reviewed it But yeah I I know what you're saying about yeah Cobb's character and the fucking you know the very end yeah, um, and then the very very end like 
Like, yeah. Like he's Paul's passed on again. It is so silly, man. Oh, come on. That was, gonna that was the, the most, that's the most predictable thing in the fucking world. Monkey and, paws and that, too. It's just such a bad way to end the film too, because I mean, give me a break. I mean, everyone can see that coming. It's so stupid. You think it'll be a sequel guys? No. <laughs> <laughs> They it, fucking set it. They set it up for one, but yeah. it's like you know. But I mean, how many films have you seen end like that the, a on, a, on, a, on a on a cliffhanger? A million, on a cliffhanger, a million, million you know, and then there's no sequel. <laughs> oh <laughs> right. my god, it just frustrates me because I when I I remember seeing the trailer to this one, and even the trailer made it look like it was more about the the be careful what you wish for thing, and I just mm-hmm. I love that concept, especially with the monkey's paw man. The thing that yeah, the thing that frustrates me about this or the the premise of this is that there's so much you can do with that. You know, be careful no. what you wish for. Like so many, I mean, there's a million million options that you can go for it. But this is this is the product, and he didn't even like use like the full wishes. Like I, I was expecting it to come well, into play more in the end too. I mean, that's kind of the whole thing after he after he gets rid of the monkey's paw. You know, Cobb's really trying to fucking you know tr- he's trying to get. Or track it down, right? Yeah. So you can use that third one. I mean, that's kind of the setup for, you know, Cobb's, well, not more or less his, his rage, but, you know, it doesn't really matter. But, you know, it's just, ugh, this, this movie could have been, this could be remade. <laughs> let's, let's face it. Remade man. three months later. Coming soon. Monkey's Paul. Well, if this was a foreign film, you know, who knows? Might be able to remake it already, but I don't know, man. I don't. I don't really know what to say about it. Do, what What are your thoughts on it, Jeremy? Um, everything that you said. Um, I I love. I didn't say this when we talked about it. I I loved. I love the setting in this film. Uh, it kind of reminded me of a. Uh, what's the movie where the girl works in a convenience store and she gets killed off? Fuck. Body bags. <laughs> yeah, body bags. Yeah. Fuck. Just fuck <laughs> too. I can't remember, but I love I love movies that have like okay, like Madison County moods, you know Madison County. That movie's mm-hmm. fucking terrible, but it has a cool has a cool feel to it. Um mm, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm like moods. I don't know really know what to say. It's like Dead Shadows. It really didn't do much for me to be completely honest. What do you think was better, Moods, Dead Shadows or the Monkey's Paw? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with oh god, that's such a hard. I choice. gotta I gotta go with Monkey's Paw. Just to be completely honest, I fucking hated Dead Shadows. Not Dead Shadows. Yeah. You know the thing is, both films have elements that I do like. Like I said, the premise of Monkey's Paw is really cool. A Dead Shadows. Um, yeah, that that was a messy script too, man. Um, yeah, they, they both actually have similar problems. Yeah, like I, I found it funny, like just when, needed a couple rewrites. Yeah, when you brought up the rewrites idea, that's like immediately what popped in my head. And that is totally, you know, doesn't this mm-hmm. feel like a, like a first draft or or, or something like that? It, it kind of pisses me off. It's not screen, tight. You you know, people at Scream Factory know know what good movies are, and they probably know that these movies are complete. Not complete garbage, but pretty garbage. And they probably actually... have some type of deal with Chiller or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I, 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 I do films. want them to keep releasing the Chiller films, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. I, you know, these are – they're not all bad, but no. Are they releasing Chilling Senses too? I would assume so. I would assume so. Mm. That movie's fucking awesome. Yeah, I don't even know. I probably have to go with – I can't remember what I gave Dead Shadows as a rating. I think but... we was in the six range. At least I was. Hmm. Yeah, I think I was lower. I think I, I might, so I probably have to go with Dead Shadows, but, uh, I don't know. This one just, this one irritated me so much just because it's just messy script. Could have been, it's just executed poorly. So, but, you know, I was really hoping. I'm, I'm curious like this to see what the budget more. of the budget was for this movie. I know uh, it's a chiller prob- movie, so it's probably really low. It's probably really low. So- I mean, that's probably why it feels like a first draft because they didn't have money to, you know, write a stronger, you know, first draft. I, I, mm-hmm. But I, I do think that, that it felt high quality enough in terms of locations and money wise. It, it just the, the script was not there. They, they it oh, needed more, way more work. It's the main. It's the main problem in the film. Yeah, it, it, right? it definitely is because we have like, good. I mean, 
well, like there's some there's some pretty good uh, you know there's some pretty decent effects in it. Like you said, settings and stuff, and in multiple locations. I mean, there was obviously some type of cast thrown at this, but you know you can do all you want with those type of things. You can have a fantastic setting, you know, great acting, you know, awesome effects. But if your script is like this, then it's kind of a fail in my in my opinion. Even I would even go as far as saying is the monkey's paw itself was not a very good prop. I, I was maybe wanted some like articulation, maybe like the fingers to come down as like a wish was granted or something. Like I don't know, <laughs> man. It was it just looked like a piece of like it, it kind prop. of anim- animates itself <laughs> every time you make a wish. Yeah, it's, I mean that's gives you the, that's actually, usually what happens in this monkey's you know, be, paw story. Well, yeah, it, it should throw you the finger. It should give you the finger. <laughs> <laughs> give you the monkey paw finger. Yeah. It's fucking awesome. I don't have much more to say about this one. I think we all agree that exactly what the problems are and exactly what we liked. Yeah, there's just not a whole lot, man. It's basically just a really crappy version of Pet Cemetery. What's the next <laughs> chiller movie? Have they announced another chiller movie? No. 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 I bet you so, it's going to uh, be a while again. Then. So, Jeremy, what do you rate this film? Um, mm, I'm going to give it a five and a half a little bit more than average but it's not very good i really didn't enjoy it too much jp <sighs> well Are you can give it like a three um i'm gonna go with a five. Oh, i think it is know. just average yeah okay um i'm gonna go with a four and a half on this one Whoa. i mean after this that is ain't too bad man this is the second time I've watched this film, and it's just oh, – I was irritated watching this film. More than The re- Woman the second time? <laughs> this was, this is way worse than The Woman. <laughs> wow. Um, but uh, no, The Woman's a masterpiece compared to this. Oh, definitely. But um, no, this this movie just – it has way too many problems for me. It's just – it's frustrating to watch, and I just – I can't give it – I can't give it a recommendation, man. I know some people really like this film. I know I think David even said that he really liked this film, and I was actually kind of surprised that he would like a film like this as much as he said he did. So I don't know. It is what it is. But yeah, four and a half. I can't recommend it. So I also think that it doesn't even have enough like glaring issues to pick apart, right? It it really is just an a unpolished film script. So there's not much you can actually say about it. Like they did this wrong. They did this wrong. No, it's just they they didn't have enough to work with. I'd love to see the script, like the actual script, and read it and see like. I want to have like, to I would love just to like write notes on it of things that, at places that I think they should like change it up because I yeah, assume I, some I think, of it's I, improv too. I think I could fix this script up to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Seems yeah. I got some monkey's yeah. balls ideas. <laughs> I love that story, man. I love to be careful what you wish for. It's endless possibilities, dude. But that's 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 the main problem with this is that mm-hmm. it's such a good idea or premise, you know. It's, it's worked just, uh, forever. It's it, yeah, always it just, worked. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hopefully but, the uh, battery's better. Um. Yeah, I've heard good things about the battery. So. so. Yeah, me too. But yeah, so that's gonna do it uh, for the main review, Monkey's Paw. We're all around the same ballpark on that one, you know. If you not guys want to check it, quality. If, yeah, it's definitely not Hall of Fame quality. But if you do want to check it out, you can get it for really, really cheap. So, you know, if you want to take a chance, you might like it more than we did. Who knows? But if anything, you're supporting Scream Factory. So, yep. exactly. You know, these chiller films and, need and the Blu-ray sell, didn't so look get that great. Um. I didn't really notice actually. I thought it. I guess it looked normal to me. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't. But really, I thought I didn't Beneath really... looked like amazing. This this thing yeah, looked amazing. But I think I think Beneath also looks a lot better because it's in the daytime. Yeah, this movie's pre- predominantly shot in the nighttime, right? So it's pretty dark, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? So, um, but yeah. So that's gonna do it, Jeremy. All right. So thanks everybody for listening to the milestone that is the twenty fifth episode of the twenty two shots of moods and horror podcast. Your host, of course, is the man himself, Mood616. If you want to follow him on his channel, you could do so at youtube.com slash Mood616 or click the subscribe button down below. If you want to follow JP, a.k.a. the man who owes me a copy of Phantasm 2, you could do so at youtube.com slash DoubleShotJ. Of course, you could always follow me on my channel at youtube.com slash NESRule22. 
and you can always listen to us at thedevilseyes.com. And if you have any questions to email us, you could do so at 22 shots of moods and horror a n d at gmail.com. And of course, if you want to tweet us, you can do so at 22 shots podcast. We almost Let have 100 do- followers. Well, it's more than I have, which is cool. Thanks again, everybody, for listening to this week's episode. I hope everyone enjoyed it and they have a good rest of their week. And remember, JP, you owe me a copy of Phantasm 2. Final Destination next week, guys. Final Destination. Oh. We're going to get in some Tony Todd discussions on this one. Sweet. We shall talk to you guys next week with the 26th episode of the 22 Shots of Moods and Horror Podcast. Everyone have a good rest of their week. Peace. Yeah. Cool, cool. Oh, wait. Mine's not recording now like it did before. Oh, like that time we lost an entire show? Yep.